What is happening, boys and girls? Jim here, RCAD. Well, to all my channel subscribers, <laughs> you might want to skip this video. We're going to be talking about the RC Four Wheel Drive Trail Finder Two today, and uh, this one's probably going to be a lengthy conversation about this vehicle. <laughs> so, uh, this video is basically for for the newcomers to the world of crawler RCs and uh, people who may have just purchased an RC Four Wheel Drive Trail Finder Two kit. This is an RC Four Wheel Drive Trail Finder Two Mojave Two, and not being sponsored by anybody anybody at all. So if I mention the name of a product, uh, mention the name of the vehicle, uh, mention the name of tires or brand names and things of that nature, I'm not being sponsored by anybody. I'm just telling you what I purchased. Uh, a lot of the brand names that, I'm, that I went with are, you know, pretty renowned, I guess, or they've been around for a long time. Uh, I believe in quality. <laughs> and you get what you pay for when it comes to quality. And, and that, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, you can buy a lot of cheap things online and uh, that look just like the real thing. Um, there's knockoff vehicles that look like the Trail Finder 2. There's knockoff vehicles that look like the Tamiya Bruiser. And um, they are uh, exactly that. They're knockoffs. And they're not made with the same kind of quality of the materials, the, the gears, and uh, all the metal is not the same quality uh, as what you would get with a higher-end hobby-grade vehicle. So I uh, just want to put that out there. I kind of believe in quality. And um, some of the cheaper vehicles, you get what you pay for. You know, WL Toys and other things of that nature, you get what you pay for. Uh, nothing wrong with WL Toys. Or WL Toys, they're great vehicles, uh, awesome intro vehicles. I mean, when it comes to intro RC vehicles, <laughs> a ready-to-run WL Toys uh, for less than two hundred dollars is a really good deal, and uh, you really can't beat it for for a vehicle that's um, pretty decent on performance in all reality. When you compare it to the old Tycos and Nikos and Radio Shack vehicles, a WL Toys just blows all of those vehicles out of the wa water. Um, and, and they kind of blow away some of the old Tamiya vehicles as well. Um, the quality isn't quite there, you know. I mean, if, if WL Toys use better gears in their stuff um, and some better materials here and there, better electronics in their vehicles, uh, it would be a lot better served. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, you get what you pay for. And things I recommend with the WL Toys is if you get one, uh, just use it for what it is. And I, as an intro vehicle to RCs, and if you love, you know, if you like like the world of crawling RCs and you like the WL Toys, then maybe move into a hobby grade vehicle from there. All right, so we're talking about an RC four wheel drive vehicle and not a WL Toys. <laughs> All right, so the Trail Finder 2 Mojave 2, the reason that I went with this truck, once again, I was out of the hobby for many years and then I got back into it. So um, basically, I was looking for a Jeep Cherokee. I bought an 01 Jeep Cherokee XJ Limited uh, way back in the day, and I was looking for a vehicle that I could paint up to match my Jeep. <laughs> so um, I started, you know, getting on Facebook and uh, getting on YouTube, and I was looking at SCX24 uh, Jeep Cherokees, or the SC, not SCX24, but the SCX102 uh, Jeep Cherokee is what I was looking at. And that was what I was looking at initially, and I was checking that out on YouTube. And, and then I started coming across uh, the Tamiya Bruisers, and I was like, wow, you know, the Tamiya Bruiser, I didn't know that they still made that vehicle. That was something that they made from the early 80s, and, um, you know, obviously still continue to make. And that was something that I always wanted as a kid was the Tamiya Bruiser, which looks exactly like this, the Toyota pickup. Uh, a slightly different style body. Uh, leaf springs are spaced out a little bit differently. The, the Toyota the Tamiya Bruiser, I believe the springs are a little bit wider apart on the front which kind of cuts down on your turning radius. Um, the wider that is across here, uh, you won't be able to turn your wheels as far to the inside before your tires start rubbing on the leaf springs. So that's kind of an unattractive quality. Uh, another thing about the Toyota Bruiser, to me a Bruiser, is that it's covered in skid plates. It has skid plates all over the place. Skid plates on the front differential, skid plates on the rear differential, <laughs> skid plates all over the place on that vehicle. And uh, I tell you what, they look great when it's sitting on the shelf, but those skid plates don't do a lot of don't do you a lot of good when you're off road. Uh, basically, they're snag points. They're, they're areas that your vehicle can get snagged on a rock or get snagged on whatever, and it seriously dampers and hampers your off road performance. Uh, so those skid plates, you know, they look good once again sitting on a shelf, but uh, real real world application, they're not helping you out one bit. <laughs> they're actually hurting you. So. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit different. A little bit of a difference between the TF2s and the Timia Bruisers is that the TF2 spring spacing is a little bit closer together compared to the Bruiser. Once again, I was looking at, started looking at Timia Bruisers, and I was uh, looking online, looking at YouTube videos, watched a lot of YouTube videos on the Bruiser, and then I started seeing a couple of YouTube videos that had trail finders mixed in with the Bruiser, and I was like, hey, what's what's that vehicle? You know, what's that all about? 
And so I started checking all that out, and I was like, okay, well, maybe that's just a cheap knockoff, like a WL Toys version of a bruiser. Uh, not necessarily the case. I started doing some research on the bruiser, because I was thinking about buying one. At that point in time, I think the bruiser was selling for right around $700, which was pretty expensive uh, just for the kit. That's all you're getting is the truck. And, uh, you know, that's that's a lot of money, you know, for just, for just the truck. Uh, this one was pretty expensive, too, when I purchased this. I want to say it was a little over $400 for this kit. But, you know, it was a lot cheaper than the Bruiser, I can tell you that. So, uh, once again, I, I was doing research on the Bruiser. Uh, I started looking at aftermarket parts for the Tamiya Bruiser, you know. Uh, obviously, when you get a new vehicle, it's not going to stay stock for very long before you start beefing it up and building it up. So, I wanted to see what kind of aftermarket parts were available for the Toyota Bruiser or the Tamiya Toyota Bruiser. And uh, what I discovered is that the majority of the aftermarket parts for the Tamiya Bruiser were made by RC four-wheel drive. <laughs> so I was like, well, that's kind of weird, eh? Uh, the majority of the parts for the Bruiser, these, these, all the modifications that you can get for it, the revolver shackles and different leaf springs and uh, drive shafts and different axles and everything else was all made by RC four-wheel drive. And uh, that got me thinking, you know, if I'm going to buy a vehicle <laughs> and I'm going to be putting a bunch of aftermarket parts on it and all the aftermarket parts seem to be made by RC four-wheel drive, then why not buy the RC four-wheel drive instead? Uh, you know, it just seemed like the best way to go. <laughs> instead of getting the $700 Tamiya, uh, which is right around $1,000 nowadays in 2022, it's I want to say it's right around 1100 bucks for that truck, um, give or take. Um Going with the Trailfinder 2 was a much better option. Uh, why not go with the company that makes all the modifications for the other vehicles? So RC four-wheel drive makes all the aftermarket parts for the most part for the, for the Bruiser. I'm not saying they make all the parts, but the majority of aftermarket parts made for the Tamiya Bruiser are made by RC four-wheel drive. So why not just go with the RC four-wheel drive truck? <laughs> another sale or another selling point for the RC four-wheel drive vehicle uh, is that this one had a two-speed transmission in it. And it was four-wheel drive in both gears. So four-wheel drive in low range, four-wheel drive in high range. The Bruiser has a three-speed transmission in it. And it's only four-wheel drive in first gear. According to my information, I could be wrong on this. I don't own a Bruiser, so I could be wrong on this. If a Bruiser owner out there steps in and wants to correct me on it, feel free. <laughs> but to my knowledge, the Tamiya Bruiser has a three-speed transmission. It's only four-wheel drive in first gear. Second and third gear are two-wheel drive. Now, that wasn't appealing to me. If I was getting a four-wheel drive vehicle and it had a three-speed transmission in it, then it should be four-wheel drive in all three speeds, in my opinion. Or at least four-wheel drive in first and second gear, and then maybe two-wheel drive for the third gear just for going out on the street and going wide open, I suppose. But uh, vehicles like this aren't necessarily meant to go fast. <laughs> so uh, that's you know a little bit out of the question. But regardless, uh, if I was going to go with a vehicle that had a two-speed transmission or a three-speed transmission, I preferred that it was four-wheel drive in both speeds. And the uh, Trailfinder 2 was... To me, a bruiser was not. Once again, only four-wheel drive in first gear, second and third gear, two-wheel drive. So once again, between the, the transmission on the bruiser and uh, the overall price on the bruiser and uh, the fact that all the aftermarket parts or the majority of the aftermarket upgrade parts for the bruiser were made by RC four-wheel drive, <laughs> I decided just to go with the RC four-wheel drive instead. Uh, a couple hundred dollars cheaper, uh, several hundred dollars cheaper nowadays. I bought this in 2016, I want to say. And uh, when I bought it, once again, it was right around $420. Um, no puns intended or anything like that. It was right around $420 for the kit. And once again, to me, a Bruiser was over $700 at that point in time. Uh, currently, I think you can get a Trailfinder 2 for a little bit less than $420. And the Tamiya kit has gone through the roof, once again, at over $1,000. For the Tamiya kit. That, once again, I could be wrong on price. It might be $999, <laughs> but it's uh, right around $1,000 US for the Tamiya Bruiser. So once again, uh, nowadays, it's even more of a reason to get the Trailfinder 2 <laughs> versus buying the Bruiser. I don't know what Tamiya was thinking by jacking up that price like that. Well, I kind of do. Uh, there's an aftermarket company or a clone company. Uh, I believe it's called HG. I'm not too sure if it's HG or what, but they make an HG vehicle, HGP something p102 or p60 something i'm not too sure uh, but it's a knockoff of the tamiya bruiser and when that vehicle first came out which was eh, about three or four years ago i want to say that they were selling that vehicle ready to run which looks just like the tamiya toyota, toyota bruiser for less than 300 dollars. and now i think they sell it for a little over 400 dollars. but the um once again it's a knockoff of the tamiya bruiser looks identical to it but the 
the internal gears and mechanics of it are made of cheaper materials. So um, your differential gears may, may, may be made out of like a, a pop metal or a really soft pewter type metal <laughs> versus uh, like a steel gear or something like that. So uh, those knockoff vehicles, once again, made with cheaper materials, they tend to break faster and getting replacement parts for them are uh, next to impossible. Uh, so really, you end up losing money when you buy something like that. Uh, but I think when that vehicle came out, that HG version of the Tamiya Bruiser, I think when that vehicle came out, that's right around the time that Tamiya decided to jack up their price to <laughs> a little over $1,000 for the Tamiya Bruiser. Um, so a little bit of a separation on price there between the knockoff and the Bruiser. Um, in my eyes, when Tamiya did that, when they raised up that price like that, that was more incentive for the average everyday person to go buy the cheaper one. You know, why would they spend $1,000 for that Tamiya when they can get this one that looks just like it? for you know less than 400 and it's ready to run so i, I think that team kind of made a mistake when they raised up their price like that uh once again i'm thinking i'm thinking to compete with that uh knockoff or to put a little separation in between their vehicle and that knockoff vehicle uh regardless the rc four wheel drive trail finder 2 the price actually went down a little bit <laughs> so uh it's a great vehicle and in my eyes this is a much better vehicle than the uh, to me, a bruiser by far. Uh, once again, if you're going to be putting aftermarket parts on a vehicle and they're all made by RC four wheel drive, then you might as well get the RC four wheel drive vehicle to begin with. And then you know that there's no question that the aftermarket parts are going to fit your vehicle. You're putting RC four wheel drive parts on RC four wheel drive vehicle, uh, a little bit more guaranteed that they're going to fit. All right. So we got all that covered and we are what? 11 minutes. Holy Moses. 11 minutes into the video here. And we're just talking about why I purchased the TF2. All right, so the Trail Finder 2, this guy has gone through many, many changes throughout its day. Excuse me for a second, my cigarette went out. Yes, I'm a smoker. I do smoke cigarettes. Uh, you know, smoking is bad. Don't smoke. That's why they put Surgeon General warnings on packs of cigarettes and things of that nature, because smoking is bad for you, so do not smoke. Uh, don't start smoking. It's a very difficult habit to stop smoking. And, um, yeah, um... Wish I never started. That's the moral of the story. So smoking is bad for you. Do not smoke. I do not recommend it. All right, back to the TF2. The RC four wheel drive trail finder two. <laughs> oh, excuse me for laughing. I just don't know where to begin with this one here. I built the truck in 2016. It's currently 2022, and uh, right now it's it's basically the best setup that I've ever had on it, uh, except that it could use some improvements. And that is the shock length overall is the main main improvement that it could use. Um, right now I have a set of Timia Gold 92 millimeter shocks on here. Those are off of a clod buster or they're meant for a clod buster. And we actually have the box for that right here. Uh, Monster truck shocks. Timia RC parts, part number OP369. OP369. Oh, wait, maybe not. Uh, there's an item number over on this side. Yeah, this is a real professional video. <laughs> okay, well, whatever our item number is right there is our item number. Yeah, I might have to pause it for that one. I'm sitting in a different position, so I can't exactly see the camera very well. So, some Tamiya Gold Monster Truck Shocks Aluminum Oil Filled Damper Set. Uh, these are a 92 millimeter shock. I don't know if the camera's going to focus in on it, but 92 millimeters. This is for the Juggernaut setup at 92 millimeters for the Cloudbuster and uh, Bullhead. They set it up at 106 millimeters, but you're not gaining any extra suspension travel between that 92 and the 106. Uh, they're getting a little bit of extra length just off that shock end. And unfortunately, a lot of different shock companies measure their shocks like that. <laughs> uh, they'll just give you a longer shock end and say it's a larger shock. But in all reality, you're not getting any more suspension travel out of your vehicle. You're just getting a longer shock to accommodate a lift, essentially. Uh, so your truck's getting uh, sitting up a little bit higher, but you're not getting any more travel out of it. So it kind of defeats the purpose, uh, in my eyes, anyways. If you're going to get a 106 6mm shock, you might as well have that full travel. Uh, you're not getting 106 millimeters of travel. The 106 millimeters is the overall length from end to end. Uh, but once again, going from a 92 millimeter shock from end to end to 106 millimeter shock from end to end, you're not gaining any more travel between these two, once again, just because they put a different end link on it. 
And once again, a lot of different shock companies do that. And that's a problem that I ran into with this vehicle. Um, not to get up too far off track, but we're talking about shocks here. Uh, Boom Racing, for instance. Once again, this is a problem that I had. Looking for aftermarket shocks. Going from our RC four-wheel drive shocks to a longer shock. I wanted to go with 110s. Uh, I had a set of 100 millimeters on this in the beginning uh, when we were getting all that crazy flex out of it. Uh, well, we could step it back. <laughs> like I said, didn't know where to start with this vehicle. Uh, originally, what the vehicle comes with like a 70 millimeter shock on the front and maybe an 80 or something like that on the back. And I stepped it up to uh, some RC four-wheel drive 90 millimeter shocks. So I had a shock just like this, but a 90 millimeter. Uh, so all four, all the way around, 90 mils on all four corners. And uh, shortly after that, I stepped it up to 100 millimeter shocks, which are these guys right here. And we had that in the one video uh, where I showed the vehicle all crazy flexed out and twisted out, was running the 110 millimeters on it, or with the 100 millimeters on it. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me, 100 millimeter, 100 millimeter. And I was going to step it up to 110s, and uh, which I think would ultimately be uh, the best way to go with it. I think I'd need a set of 100s on the front and a set of 110s on the back would probably be a good setup. But I bought these Boom Racing shocks, these Recon G6 Boom Racing shocks. Uh, here's our part number, BRS1011OGM, 110 millimeters, supposedly. Get the camera to focus in on it, but 110 millimeter shot. So I got four of these guys, and these are internally sprung, once again, very similar to that RC four-wheel drive shock. Uh, but the, it's not a true 110 millimeters. <laughs> You're not getting that full travel that you would think that you would get. They're getting that extra length, once again, off of the end that they put on here to make it 110 millimeters. But you're not getting that full travel. This has got the softest spring in there, and this is fully compressed right here. It's fully compressed. There's a lot of smooth shock shaft right there that's exposed. And to me, I'd like to use that extra quarter inch plus a travel if I possibly could and uh, yeah kind of bind up a little bit so they say that these can be oil filled they say that this is a 110 millimeter shock this is an RC four wheel drive 100 millimeter shock boom racing 110 millimeter shock end to end eyelet to eyelet there's not much of a difference right there <laughs> between these two not much of a difference at all Definitely not 10 millimeters, I can tell you that. That's like two, maybe three millimeter difference right there. Now, compressed RC full drive compresses almost completely. There's not much bare shaft left over uh, before that piston is bottomed out. These guys, on the other hand, there's a lot of leftover shaft on it. Uh, we can compress these both down at the same time, RC four wheel drive, and the other guy. We're still getting more travel out of that 100 millimeter shock versus that 110 from Boom Racing. So the aftermarket Boom Racing 110 millimeter internally sprung shocks are uh, don't give you as much travel as you get with the 100 millimeter RC four wheel drive shocks. So you're getting robbed on travel. <laughs> Moral of the story. These are brand new. I've got four of these things. These boom racing shocks. Once again, they say they're 110 millimeters, but they're not. They are not. They may be 110 millimeters overall in total length once you get the shock end on there. But you're not getting that in travel. I can tell you that. Uh, not that you would get that 110 millimeters of full travel. But uh, these guys at 110 millimeter, air quotations, and these guys at 100 millimeters, have more travel than the 110s. You line them up butt to butt, end to end, push them down, and the RC full drive shock, ah, we'll get these guys even, bottoms out farther. So getting robbed on shock length with these guys and overall travel with the boom racing. The Tamiya shocks, once again, 92 millimeters or whatever it says that is, uh, yeah, 92 millimeters. We're getting the full amount of travel that we should. Once again, we're not getting 92 millimeters of overall travel. We're getting half that distance down here with the actual shock. But uh, you're getting the full distance. It is what it says it is. Put it that way. They're not they're not pulling the fast one on you by switching out the end link and telling you that it's 110 millimeters when it's technically a 92 millimeter. So to me, it's not lying. It is what it is. And that is why I'm running these to me a gold shocks on there currently. 
uh, because that's what I had laying around. They were the right diameter, the right thickness to fit in here on the Trail Finder 2. So that is what I used. Ultimately, the vehicle will be better off served with a set of um, 100 millimeters on the front and a set of 110s on the back. You get a little bit more travel out of the back than what you do out of the front. So I think the best setup on this thing would be a set of uh, 100s on the front and 110s on the back. Be a set of uh, 100s on the front and 110s on the back once again um, but coming up trying to find the proper shock that's going to fit the vehicle is the is the tough part you need to find a shock that's relatively skinny in diameter and that is just for the rear suspension setup more than the front more than the front suspension setup uh, we'll peel the body off of it here and uh, get a better look at that that setup that i'm talking about here um, on the back uh, we don't have to take the body off it let's look at the back i've got the shock set up basically in a stock formation going to that center shock post up there on the frame rail and i've got it set on the third hole so a third hole from the center is where i've got the shock sitting at now here's the problem that you run into with shock diameter uh, you got to stay somewhat skinny on the shock diameter or else this shock setup's not going to work especially not with leaf springs because your shocks are going to start to hit your leaf springs Right now, full articulation, we've got plenty of clearance in between our leaf spring and our shock. Um, but when it's fully extended, it's getting a little bit tight. So that's where you start to run into issues with your shock diameter on the back of the TF2. If you get too fat of a shock on there, it's going to hit your leaf springs when you start to compress your suspension. And that's going to kind of defeat the purpose of everything. <laughs> so uh, you got to be careful with the TF2s on how fat of a shock that you put on this thing. Now the shock mounts on the back of this vehicle, looking at the back of the vehicle here, I'm going to be knocking stuff over here in the process. We see these shock hoops on the back. I just put those on there basically to hold up these little plastic trim panels on the back. Was that an orb that just flew by? That was crazy. Wow, check that out. I thought that was a single orb. I just kind of caught it out of the corner of my eye through the camera lens. But it's multiple orbs, and they kind of separate before it gets to the tire. If you look at the orbs on the left-hand side, they kind of separate right there, just before it gets to the tire, and then they rejoin and form a weird chain link as they disappear. Yeah, you see orbs all the time in my videos, and uh, they seem to make my brain skip a beat when they fly by. I don't really necessarily see them out, out through the naked eye, but when I review the video in editing, I, I've noticed that they make me skip a beat. <laughs> Uh, or I skip a beat and an orb flies by or flies into my finger or something that's crazy. Anywho, there we go. Cool orb sighting. We see these shock hoops on the back. I just put those on there basically to hold up these little plastic trim panels on the back. Was that an orb that just flew by? That was crazy. So I just put this on here to basically hold these trim panels in place, which blocks the underside of the bed so you don't see all the wires and other things that are sticking up from underneath. But these are the stock shock hoops off the front. Now we could use these on the back for shock hoops if we wanted to. Only problem is, is that we're actually losing suspension travel with those shock hoops. We have more suspension travel with the current setup with the shocks spread out like it is right here than if we were to put it up to those mounts right there. As soon as we switch it up to those mounts, we don't get as much articulation from left to right with the rear axle that we get with our current setup. So having using these for shock hoops on the back is uh, kind of defeats the purpose and you'd end up losing out a little bit. <laughs> the shock hoops on the front. Now, when I purchased these and put these on here, I painted these myself. Um, these were black. And now they're like a cardinal red or something like that. Ford, Ford cardinal red is what that color is. These are off of a Glenda 2. So these are Glenda 2 shock hoops on the front. Now, I believe in the year 2022, I put these on in 2016. Uh, these are longer than the stock shock hoops, so you get a little bit more travel out of these guys, or you can accommodate larger shocks on these guys. There is two shock mounting holes. There's an upper hole and a lower hole. We've got it mounted on the lower hole right now. Uh, when I had the 100 millimeters on there, I had it mounted on the upper hole. And in the current situation, 2022, they do make a set of shock hoops for the TF2 that are longer, and they're specifically made for the TF2. Once again, these are made for the Glenda 2. And they do mount under the TF2, but the TF2 mounts, for the, or the newer TF2 mounts, uh, might sit on here a little bit better. <laughs> or they might be uh, designed a little bit better just because they were designed for the TF2 
versus the Glenda 2. So Glenda 2 shock hoops on the front, and we have the stock front shock hoops on the back, and they are just basically there to hold this plastic panel in, in place once again. If we were to use these, once again, as shock mounts, we would get less travel out of the vehicle, not as much articulation out of the vehicle. So uh, once again, only reason they're sitting there is for support. All right, uh, so that basically covers our shocks. <laughs> For the time being, anyways, or at least for the moment. Uh, let's see, we already get a sip of coffee so we can uh, continue talking. Orbs cost me many retakes when I'm doing videos. Mental note. All right, so we got our Notice the abominable snowman on the left hand uh, side of the screen there. He the seems to react with the orbs as well. Whatever it's pretty are, crazy, uh, but he does react with the orbs. He seems to be possessed. <laughs> Dollar store abominable snowman. Right, so pretty much just covers and, our uh, Yeah, it seems to react with the orbs. <laughs> Talking about shocks. Another mental note uh, that abominable snowman orbs. will go months without moving. Months. But if you wave to it and say hi, it'll move. How crazy uh, is that? And sometimes that orb influence seems to be so strong that I just lose my thought altogether and just forget what I'm talking about altogether. And that's what happened right here. All right, so that's just touching base on our suspension real quick and why we have the Tamiya Gold Shocks on there currently. Once again, I think the best setup, not to be redundant here, but uh, in case you missed it, I think the best setup on this vehicle would be a set of 100 millimeter shocks. Uh, brand, what brand you go with is uh, kind of important. Once again, you don't want to get lied to on the overall shock length like the Boom Racing ones kind of do. I'm not saying these guys are liars. They are a 110 millimeter shock in total length. Uh, once you get that shock end on there, but you're not getting the same kind of travel out of it as you would with a, a true 110 millimeter. These are 100 millimeter shocks, uh, and it's, you know, they're 100 millimeters with the end links on them, but you get more travel out of these 100 millimeter shocks than you do with these air quotations, 110 millimeter shocks. So once again, no point in having a shock that's supposedly 110 millimeters when it's not. <laughs> and you're actually losing suspension travel. I put these on there and I was so bummed out. I was thinking, yeah, I'm going to have crazy suspension travel. But no, I actually lost travel when I put those shocks on there. And I had less articulation when I put those shocks on there. So yeah, shock length. That's, that's important. True shock length is important. Shock width. Making sure that you don't go too fat on the shock. Yes, you could fit a shock like this on the front. I'm not too sure how this would clear on the back with the leaf springs on the back of the vehicle. Uh, maybe with a set of links on there, it might be different. But uh, this is getting a little bit too fat uh, for the leaf springs. So trying to come up with a shock that's going to fit in here uh, is difficult to do. Uh, the Tamiya shocks, they seem to work pretty good. It's an oil-filled shock. It's a smooth action on the shock. Works fairly well. Uh, works better than our uh, spring-loaded shocks. That is for sure. Um, only drawback once again is that we're losing some length on these. We're losing a little bit of travel on these guys just because they're 92 millimeters versus 100 millimeters. And ultimately with the suspension setup that I have on the truck, uh, the current setup with everything, the way the axles are sitting, I do have a lift block on the front axle, a lift block and a degree shim. I have a degree shim only on the back axle and we'll get into those guys as well. Uh, these are degree shims that go on your axles for those who are new to the world of RCs. You can get this from RC Four Wheel Drive's website, rcfourwheeldrive.com. You can also get these at A Main Hobbies as well. Uh, they come in aluminum color. These have been colored black and colored red with uh, black markers and red markers. So this is a degree shim for the axle. You put this in between the leaf spring and the axle to pitch your axle back or pitch your axle forward to get the right drive shaft angle. Once you start lifting your vehicle, the drive shaft angles change. Uh, you start adding longer suspension, drive shaft angles change, so you want to make sure that you have the right degree on your axle so that your pitch on your drive shaft isn't uh, too extreme. So they make these guys in different sizes, different uh, widths on the wedge. Some are more of a wedge than others, some are less, less <laughs> or more of a degree, and some are less. I've got the uh, stronger degreed ones sitting in the bag still right here. These guys are pretty sharp angle on those two. So we've got a set of degree shims on the front axle, a set of degree shims on the back axle. Also have a lift block on the front axle. Now there was a time that I had lift blocks on all, all the way around the vehicle. <laughs> and I had this thing sitting up high enough that I could actually clear a set of Super Swamper or Proline Super Swamper 2.2 uh, .2 tires. So here's a set of Proline 2.2 .2 Super Swampers and these guys 
are massive compared to this truck. That is a big tire. It doesn't even fit into the wheel well. <laughs> Not at all. Not one bit. Uh, that is a gigantic tire. So there was a one, one point in time I did have 2.2s on the vehicle all the way around. Um, I had a set of 2.2 mudslingers on there at one point in time. These are RC full drive mudslingers. The wheels are boom racing. These are boom racing wheels. That is one thing I'll say about boom, boom racing is they make nice wheels. And the boom racing beadlock wheels, whether it's a 2.2 or a 1.9, that have this inner beadlock on it with the five screws. Very simple to put together. Strong wheel, well built. Uh, billet aluminum, all machined. And uh, worth every penny on these guys. So, nevertheless, there's a time that I had some 2.2 mudslingers on the vehicle, and they worked out pretty well. It was a good good tire on the vehicle. These have been custom trimmed. Uh, removed the center lug, the smaller lug out of them. So they get a little bit more flex, and uh, they clean out a lot better, <laughs> and they hook up a lot better. Uh, but these tires were just a little bit too large for it. I found that the 1.9s seemed to work out the best. And I'm currently running a set of uh, RC4 wheel drive Interco IROC 1.9s on a set of um, knockoff aluminum wheels. These came off of uh, the Wish app or eBay and one or the other. And a uh, relatively cheap wheel. Uh, not as well made as the uh, Boom Racing wheels. Uh, but they work pretty good for the price in all reality. <laughs> I want to say they were like right around $30 for a set of four. So not a bad price uh, for what they are as a knockoff wheel being cast aluminum versus uh, billet. Uh, but still not too bad. Tigers, once again, these are RC Full Drive Interco IROC 1.9s. These have been custom cut, custom trimmed. Um, so normally they don't look this aggressive. I do have a video on how to trim these tires down. If you do have a set of Interco IROC Super Swampers RC four-wheel drive tires, uh, this pattern works out quite well. They clean out awesome. They have insane flex on them. And they hook up like mad. Hook up like mad in every condition. <laughs> Whether it's uh, soft sand or rock or any of that other stuff, they, they hook up pretty darn good. And they clean out equally as well. And once again, they've got insane flex because we removed half the rubber by trimming out half of the lugs. So we do have a video on how to do that as well. Uh, so currently, once again, running a set of 1.9s on here, I found that 1.9s seem to work out the best on the vehicle. The vehicle comes with a set of 1.55 tires. Oh, talking about tires, 1.55s, that's not the overall size of the tire. That is the size of the wheel. 1.9s in general, that is the size of the wheel on the vehicle. 2.2s, that is the size of the wheel on the vehicle, not the overall diameter of the tire. So when somebody says 1.55, or 1.9 or 2.2 they're actually talking about the wheel diameter so these are 1.9 wheels and 1.9 tires now the the 1.9 tires they vary in overall sizes same with 2.2s same with 1.55s you can have 1.55s that are taller than some other 1.55s <laughs> same with 1.9s uh, some are taller than others so you need to pay attention to the overall diameter when you're looking to buy tires uh, and once again, not being sponsored by anybody, but A Main Hobbies website. If you go to amain.com or A Main Hobbies, it'll pop right up when you, if you Google it and do a little search on it. It'll pop right up. Uh, those guys uh, are one of the best for giving descriptions on tires and overall diameters and overall widths and things, things of that nature. Uh, so they're really good at giving you the, that measurement. Uh, once again, some tires are taller than others, so you don't uh, you, you might end up getting a tire that's too big or too small. Uh, some 1.9s are smaller in diameter than this one. So you have to pay attention to your tire size. These guys, I want to say, don't quote me on it, but I believe these are right around 4.65 inches in outer diameter, this tire. And um, this guy right here is a 2.2 tire. Once again, 2.2 wheel diameter. But I think this one is right around uh, 4.75 or 4.82 or something like that. So it's just under 5 inches. And this Proline 2.2 Super Swamper is much larger than this um, RC Full Drive 2.2 Mudslinger. So once again, just because the tire is a 2.2, it doesn't mean that it's that they're going to be the same height or the same overall diameter. 2.2, 1.9, 1.55. They're talking about the wheel size, not the overall diameter of the tire. So that kind of stuff plays a plays a factor when you're buying tires. <laughs> Pay attention to your tire size. Uh, some tires are larger than others, even though they have the same wheel size. I found that 1.9s seem to work the best on the old TF2. Moving on, talking about the vehicle. Um, suspension set. Let's go back to our suspension. 
All right, so when I bought the vehicle, and I bought it in kit form and built it, obviously. Um, all the A lot of the add-on parts that are on it, like uh, the RC four-wheel drive TerraFlex revolvers, which are the leaf spring shackles that are on the front of the vehicle, these guys right here. RC four-wheel drive, TerraFlex revolver. That is a shackle. I'm sorry about the reflection. Uh, but this end of the shackle twists, which gives you more flex when you're articulating the axle. It allows us to uh, go up and bend in and allows us to spring. It allows us to, to twist the shackle versus your spring. So it gives you a little bit more articulation. So I had these on there from day one. I, I bought the truck and then I ordered all these parts for it. And I put all the parts on there from day one. On the back axle, we have the same thing, a set of TerraFlex revolvers, and these are on the rear portion of the back axle. Now, as far as direction goes on mounting these, you know, <laughs> I've been told several different things. You know, some people tell me that they're facing the wrong way, some people uh, stating that they're facing the right way. Um, you know, your guess is as good as mine. They really don't give you instructions uh, when you get these TerraFlex revolvers as to what direction they go in. So I did a little trial and error with this, um, seeing what works best, and it seems to work best in the position that it's currently in. But uh, yeah, opinions may vary. So we have a set of TerraFlex revolvers on the back, on the rear portion of the rear springs. And on the front portion of the rear springs, we have a set of TerraFlex Z-boxes, which are these guys right here. TerraFlex Z-box. That is your front spring mount, and this floats up and down. So instead of being a solid mount way up high like this, actually up higher, your stock spring will be mounted like way up here. Um, this allows your spring, or allows your back axle to drop down, giving you more suspension and articulation on the back. Now you can't use the Z-boxes on the front. They will not work on the front axle just because of the transmission positioning. It may work with the single speed transmission on some of the RTR TF2s, but it will not work with the two speed transmission. So you have to use the stock spring perches on the rear portion of the front axle. But on the back axle, you can use some Z-boxes back here. And that will greatly increase your overall articulation. So TerraFlex revolvers and TerraFlex Z-boxes. And once again, I put those on there on day one. <laughs> uh, although the ones that are on the front of the vehicle, the revolvers on the front of the vehicle, those are brand new. I actually had a revolver uh, break on me uh last year one broke on me and that was the first time that i've ever had one break and it was on the vehicle since day one i bought the vehicle in 2016 um i ran this thing up and down rivers several times I've, if you know you want to see a good river video or a good water video um i've had this thing uh completely submerged several times <laughs> it's been underwater it's been fully submerged it's actually been washed down a river at one point in time the current caught it and <laughs> took it down the river and i had to go uh Go uh, play hide and seek with it or try to find it. So, um, yeah, nevertheless, it's, it's it's been underwater a lot of times. And um, that kind of stuff, if you take your vehicle into water and you play in the water, uh, if you're new to RCs, then it requires a lot of cleanup afterwards. Uh, you're going to get water inside your axles, 10 chances of one. You might get water inside your transmission. You get might get water inside your transfer case. Uh, so those are things that you need to check. Uh, your bearings on your axles and things like that, that's, you know, that all it all takes its toll on that stuff. So just things to keep in mind if you play in the water with your vehicle. Yeah, a lot of them are, air quotations, waterproof or water-friendly. That doesn't mean that you can submarine it. <laughs> the further you go underwater, the more pressure that you get. And the vehicles may be, uh, air quotations, waterproof up to a point. But the, the further you go down uh, underwater, the, the higher the pressure gets. And uh, it makes its way past, you know, the water will make it past things that are uh, supposed to be air quotations waterproof so you got to be careful about playing in the water how deep you go with your vehicle and maintenance afterwards is always required um, you can do some preventative maintenance beforehand when you're building your vehicle if you're actually building a vehicle and uh, you know use some marine grease in certain places uh, like inside your transfer case and inside your axles take your axles apart put a little bit of marine grease on the back edges of the bearings uh, just to prevent the water from getting in uh, where the bearings are stacked up on the outer portion of the axle you have like a bearing here and a bearing on the other side, um, depending on how your axle's set up. Uh, putting some grease in between the bearings, you know, like a little pillow of grease will help out for blocking the water from coming in. But you don't want to grease things up too heavy. Too much grease will actually uh, slow your vehicle down and uh, it creates too much drag. So putting grease in key points, you know, don't over grease your differential. You need it to be greased, but don't over grease it. Uh, the wheel bearings, putting some grease on the back edge of the wheel bearing where the axle goes through. Putting a big blob of grease back there just to prevent water from coming in is a good idea. 
but in generally generally speaking this is a two-piece axle which we can't see but there is a seam going right down the middle so this is a two-piece axle the top half and the bottom half so no matter how much grease you put in here no matter how much waterproofing you do to this water is always able to get in through that seam <laughs> so uh you know there you go on that aspect you can waterproof it until you're blue in the face but water is generally going to get in there um so don't over grease it grease is a good preventative but you can't ultimately you can't stop the water from getting in so if you go out and play in the water maintenance is required afterwards you may have to take your vehicle apart and do some cleaning and greasing when it comes to the TerraFlex revolvers and Z boxes, I recommend a little bit of uh, WD-40 or some kind of all-purpose lubricant on that. Uh, WD-40 not being sponsored by anybody, but works well because it, you know, it's a water repellent and uh, sheds water, so uh, that's good to put on there after the fact. And that is why one of my TerraFlex revolvers broke, is because I didn't lube it up with anything after the words. And uh, after <laughs> years of being exposed to water and uh, summers and winters, it eventually broke. So. Uh, the TerraFlex revolvers on the front are brand new. They're relatively new, so you can still see the writing on the revolver. It says TerraFlex right there. The ones on the back, on the other hand, are rusty. So these are the originals on the back. It's currently 2022. I built this in 2016, so what do we got there? Six years. They're six years old. All right, so we touch base on our TerraFlex revolvers, RC full drive TerraFlex revolvers. We touch base on the RC four uh, RC full drive TerraFlex Z boxes on the back. Uh, we touch base on our shocks momentarily. We're going to get into all this stuff again once we get our body off of it. Uh, let's go on to the body here and talk about this briefly. Uh, a testimony to the RC four wheel drive plastic. Once again, not being sponsored by anybody, but this plastic is tough. <laughs> Much tougher than the. Uh, uh, old Tamiya plastic from the 80s and things of that nature. This stuff is relatively strong. I put this truck through absolute hell. It's been rolled over uh, countless times. Countless times. It rolled over, slid down hills sideways on rocks. You know, it's, it's just scratched to uh, all the heck and beyond. <laughs> so this vehicle has been put through hell. And uh, the paint doesn't necessarily show it on camera, but to the naked eye, it is rallied. There is some major gouges in the paint here and there throughout. Um, once again, it's been put through absolute hell, but you know, a testimony to the RC four wheel drive plastic, it holds up like a champion. I've only have a, only had a few breakages on the body itself. This little piece by the window, I lost that little piece right there. It snapped out at one point in time and I cracked this pillar right here on the body at one point in time and have that glued back together. Haven't had a problem with that since, but the vehicle is, you know, six years old and, um, it's been put through hell once again. And this plastic is super strong. So, um, Way to go, RC Full Drive. You made a pretty solid body there. Or whoever, the manufacturer of the body, did a great job on that. Uh, paint job on the body. Uh, this essentially, it doesn't look like it, but this is the stock color that came on this body, which is that grayish colored plastic. And I used some Duplicolor Clear Effects uh, paint, which is a flip-flop paint job, technically. As if you put it down the way they suggest putting it down, uh, they suggest putting down flat black first, and then spraying on this metal flake. And then spraying on like clear coat and then you'll have like a you know green purple red pearl flip-flop kind of paint job going on and what i basically did is i kind of did that in reverse order and removed the black paint altogether <laughs> so i took the uh metal flake and i just sprayed that metal flake that came in that duplicolor clear effects uh, is what it's called clear effects and i i used that metal flake and i sprayed that down on the body i emptied out two cans on this thing um, you know, from the front half of the body and the bed itself and the back portion of the of the cab. Two cans of paint in total on this guy with just pure metal flake. And then afterwards, I used two cans of clear coat. <laughs> so it's got a lot of paint on there. Um, it's It might add some weight to it. I'm sure it's going to add some weight to it, but it does have a lot of paint on there. And it's basically all metal flake. So it changes colors depending on what angle that you're looking at it. And once again, uh, since I used that metal flake on it and used that clear coat over top of it, it hides a lot of scratches. So I basically used that stock color and put metal flake and clear coat on it. That way, when it did get a scratch, you weren't going to see it as often just because it was metal flake over top of the stock color. You weren't scraping off uh, a paint color. So if I painted this thing black, let's say, or red, let's say, and you scratched it, what are you going to see underneath? You're going to see that gray of the original plastic. <laughs> and that's no good. And it shows scratches. So once again, I used our stock plastic color. 
I blasted it with a couple cans of Metal Flake and then blasted it with a couple cans of Clear Coat and it hides all the scratches. Um, once again, on camera, uh, from far away, you really can't see any scratches on this thing, but you start getting in close and you can tell that it is hammered. It's got a lot of scratches throughout the body. But that uh, color kind of hides it a little bit. Once again, it's kind of that flip-flop paint job, so you're seeing a lot of different pearlescence in the color. Different angles, you see different colors. A lot of that um, blue and purple around the edges there. So the body does change colors. If you were to ask what color the body is, it's <laughs> closer to a tan uh, with the naked eye than gray. But... Uh, it's just, once again, all metal flake throughout the body. And then whatever you use as a um, background colors reflects other colors in the body. So I'm using a lot of red here in the background. And you'll pick that up in the paint. You know, you'll pick up the red. You're picking up the red off the hook, the red off the winch line, uh, the red off this uh, uh, winch anchor up on the roof, that spike. That stuff shines through on the paint. You know, you get little bits of red here and there just because of the red that's in this stuff. Kind of makes it pop out of the paint. And uh, right now I've got a black pinstripe going down the side. That is just some cheap sticker pinstriping that you buy from an automotive store. But uh, once again, the, the color of the paint reflects different stuff. So if I wanted to put a red pinstripe down here, that would put out bring out more red in the body. If I put a blue pinstripe down here, it would bring out more of the blues in that paint. And so on and so forth. A green pinstripe would bring out more greens in the paint. But uh, I just kind of went with black on this one just to kind of keep it simple. And that kind of covers our paint portion of the vehicle. Um, back here, certain areas just brushed on black, you know, blah, blah, blah. Little highlights, little touches. Windshield wipers, uh, just a little bit of silver on the arms, you know. It may not look uh, all that good, but whatever. It's better than it did <laughs> in stock form. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, grill on the front, all this stuff is painted on after the fact. Uh, initially... I didn't have anything painted on the grill. It was just that stock color on the body. And then I came in here with a, uh, a tester's paint marker and painted all this stuff black after the fact with the paint marker. Painted around the headlights, this stuff here. I did that after the fact with that paint marker. Should have did it beforehand. It would have been uh, much better served. Stuff in the grill. Painted that after the fact with that tester's black paint marker. Same thing down here on the bottom of the uh, lower air dam below the bumper. Painted that after the fact. Turn signal lenses and things of that such. All right, so these guys come smoked, like a smoked lens or a clear lens. This is clear, this is clear. The tail light on the back here, this little marker light, that is clear as well. It's a clear lens that they put on that. And the tail light on the, and the lights for the tail lights themselves, those are clear as well. Uh, these are the optional tail light lenses that you can buy from RC Full Drive. They are painted and they don't have these all the time. Sometimes they're pre-order. So you have to pre-order these guys. And these guys have been put through hell. They're broken away on the sides, cracked. This is a rollover damage. <laughs> Thank goodness for these uh for these Marlin crawlers steel wraparound bumpers because they save the body from a lot of damage. A Toyota emblem on the rear, not being sponsored by anybody. This is from RC Four Wheel Drive once again. And this doesn't come spelled out as Toyota. <laughs> These are all individual letters. And it's spelled out differently. So you have to take each letter off the sticker backing and place it on manually. And spell out Toyota. And uh, make sure that you have it all spaced out perfectly and level. Because once again, these are individual stickers. Each one of these letters is an individual sticker. And it's uh, like a metal, metal background. It's got a little bit of depth to it. So that is actual metal, just with a sticker background on it, or a sticker backing on it. So we got that on there. Um, the lenses, once again, getting back to the lenses, these were clear. I colored this red with a, not being sponsored by anybody, but a red Sharpie marker. I use Sharpies for a lot of things. Hey, Sharpie, if you want to sponsor me, I use your product all the time. Love your products. So red Sharpie <laughs> on our lenses back here, on the inside of the lenses, uh, to paint them red, or to color those red. And it's translucent. Light shines through. On our front turn signals and marker lights, this is an orange neon Sharpie. 
Now, I don't like giving this person a lot of credit, but he, you know, <laughs> basically he's responsible for getting me back into the RC hobby. So RC Sparks, Aaron from RC Sparks. I got this idea from him. And that is using an orange neon Sharpie uh, to color these lenses. Now, unfortunately, Aaron and I have had a little bit of a falling out. Um, I, I try making up with them and I uh, try being nice with them. And I, I'm still cool with them. I, I have no problem with Aaron. But uh, for some reason, I think he's got me blocked and he doesn't answer any of my comments or anything like that. So uh, regardless, we used to talk at one point in time. We don't really talk anymore. And yeah, there it is. But I got this idea from RC Sparks, old Aaron. And it was a good idea. Good idea, Aaron. And that is using an orange neon Sharpie. These Sharpies come in little four packs. The neon Sharpies, orange neon. And that is what I use to color these lenses. And that is a perfect color for the turn signal and marker light lenses. Once again, translucent. So it reflects the light back out and looks great on the vehicle. So little, little tips there. Thanks, Aaron. Once again, RC Sparks for that little tip there. Once again, you don't talk to me, <laughs> but I wouldn't mind talking to you. So uh, if you want to unblock me, that'd be cool. All right. So there we go. We got our lenses covered. We got our body covered, our multiple paints that are on the body. Uh, light bar on the roof. That is a Proline curved light bar. I believe that is a six inch curved light bar. I put that one on there from day one. It's been put through hell as well, this light bar. Let's just take our camera off the tripod so we can move this around a little bit easier, eh? So this light bar has been put through hell. It's been submerged countless times, and it still works great. But it's starting to get some separation factor going on. <laughs> Things are starting to come apart on it, but it still works great. And it's been put through hell, so what can you say? That Proline light bar uh, was worth every penny that I paid for it. Wind shook up on the roof. That's an odd place for a wind shook. Well, it is what it is. <laughs> All right, so this is an RC four-wheel drive uh, winch spike. I said winch hook, winch spike up on the roof. So this is an RC four-wheel drive winch spike, and you use this for an anchor. If you get stuck, you know, you drive the spike down on the ground, gives you a spot to hook onto with your winch. And the mounts for this spike, well, let's cover a couple things. This is made by RC four-wheel drive. Not sure if they make these anymore. Uh, when I bought these, I bought like, like six of them at one point in time, and I'm really running out, <laughs> running out of these quick. I, I lost a few of them and uh, yeah, these guys are getting little, running low. They're getting scarce. So this is an RC four wheel drive winch anchor. The mount I'm using is a Proline light bar mount. So this Proline light bar came with several different mounts in the packaging. Uh, I think I got one laying around here. Here we go. So here this belongs to my brother. This is a Proline uh, four inch light bar. There we go, there's a light bar right down there, a little four inch light bar. And this comes with several different mounts in it. And some of the mounts, or two of the mounts, are these guys right here. These mounts. And that is for mounting the light bar to a roll bar. That little circle clamp there would clamp around the roll bar, and then you would uh, fit the light bar in between on the other part right here. And there you go. So this is a Proline light bar mount right here. I've got it screwed to the side of the upper portion of the cab on the roof. And then just have the winch spike sliding between those two mount points. And it gives me a good location for the anchor. I'm not too sure if that is legal, this anchor, for crawling purposes. I've never been to a competition. Oh, this one's right there. Never been to a competition crawl. So I'm not too sure if using a winch spike is legal <laughs> or allowed or whatever. But uh, I do know um, from what I've heard about going to those competition crawls and things of that nature, if it's not on your vehicle, you're not allowed to use it. So if you've got a winch anchor, it needs to be on your vehicle, attached to your vehicle or sitting on your vehicle in some place or form or another, or else you're not allowed to use it for getting unstuck. Um, the winch on the front of this vehicle is probably <laughs> not allowed either. This is an RC full drive 8274 uh, Warren winch or a Warren 8274. Uh, this is one of the original 8274 Warren winches. Uh, another nod to RC Sparks. I've seen this on his channel when that winch first came out and I bought it immediately. <laughs> so there we go. RC full drive 8274. Very strong winch and worth every penny. These guys are uh, awesome. This thing's been underwater several times, countless times. It's not supposedly waterproof. They say it's not waterproof, but man, it's held up to the test of time and it still works great. Winch line on this one. Uh, this is some suffix fishing line and it's 36 pound test lead core fishing line. So there's a lead core in here. It's 36 pound test. Uh, so the winch line, winch line will break before anything else breaks. 
and uh, it works pretty good. The winch can pull 50 pounds dead weight, 70 pounds rolling, and uh, 50 pounds of pulling power is pretty darn strong. You can start bending things on your truck. If you got an axle snagged on it, and you're putting 50 pounds of pulling strength on this thing, you can start breaking things. <laughs> so uh, they do sell winch lines that have like a 220 pound braking strength. But uh, I tell you what, man, you're going to start breaking parts on your truck before you end up breaking that line. So I've used a suffix fishing line, which has a 36 pound test braking strength on it. Which, you know, 36 pounds, that's plenty of pulling power to get your vehicle out. If it doesn't come out with 36 pounds of pulling power on it, then it, you know, you should probably just pick it up <laughs> and find out why it's stuck. So uh, using some 36 pound test fishing line comes in multiple different colors. Uh, I believe it's like uh, 10 yards per color. So uh, one roll of this stuff has like 10 yards of red and 10 yards of gold and 10 yards of blue and 10 yards of whatever. Multiple colored fishing line. Uh, so there we go. That is what I'm using on that. Tow hook. You can't get these anymore. Once again, talking about stuff you just can't get anymore. The winch. Thank God you can still get this guy. That suffix fishing line. You can get that stuff. Pro line light bar. That is available. Winch spike. Not too sure about that one. Tow hook. Uh, not available anymore. And I believe this is a RC full drive monster Kong tow hook. And once again, they don't make this guy anymore. But that was a good tow hook. And I used to have several of these things, but I lost a few of them. And this is one of the last ones that I have. We got one on here and one on my brother's 6x6. And that is the last Monster Monster Kong tow hook that, uh, that we got laying around. Yeah, looking at the tire rack in the back of the vehicle. <laughs> so we got a tire rack back here, but no spare tire sitting on here. Once again, that extra weight seriously hinders your vehicle when you're going off-road. I used to have a RC four-wheel drive diamond plate aluminum toolbox bolted in back here, uh, which was pretty cool. A little flip-up lid on it, diamond plate. You could put all your uh, winch spikes and anchors and tow lines and everything else inside that box. Only problem was when you, whenever you flip the vehicle, that lid would come open and it was a complete yard sale. You'd have to pick up all those parts, you know, out of the leaves and debris or whatever you rolled your truck into. <laughs> so you had to uh, find all that stuff and it, you know, a little bit of a pain in the butt. Uh, after a while, I ended up gluing some magnets in the lid of that toolbox, so it kept the lid shut. Uh, but it was still too much weight in the back of the vehicle. Having that extra toolbox back here and having a full-size spare tire on the back really hinders your vehicle when you're going off-road. Um, you can't climb up hills that are as steep just because of that extra weight back there. It wants to flip the truck over backwards. So having that extra weight back there, it looked cool. It looked very scale. It looked very realistic. But uh, a serious hindrance when you're going off-road. So that stuff was eliminated. I basically basically left this rack back here just as a hanging point for this tow line that I've got tied onto the back bumper. <laughs> so uh, that's all that I use this for currently. It's just a spot to uh, rest this um, shackle, which basically just slides over the end. I've got a uh, little piece of uh, wire insulation right there on top of the thread for the tire hold down. And that kind of keeps this part in check as it slides over top of that rubber grommet. Keeps it from popping off. And it works pretty well. So I'm using that just as a hanger for that tow rope. Bumpers and all that other good nonsense. Once again, RC four-wheel drive Marlin crawlers. All metal or steel bumpers on the vehicle, front and rear. Add these on there for quite some time. Yes, there is rust. Look at all that rust. That's because this thing is spent... <laughs> a lot of time underwater so yeah a lot of rust on those uh bumper mounts but it's a solid bumper once again unfortunately uh they say they make it they still make it it's still listed but very difficult to find endlessly backordered rc four wheel drive rock sliders metal rock sliders i did have a set on here they're fastened right here and uh well right around here i believe and those were a serious hindrance when going off-road once again big snag point those extra metal parts metal doesn't slide across rocks as easy as plastic does it sounds cool having an all-metal truck once again but the more metal you have on it <laughs> the heavier your vehicle gets and uh, metal doesn't slide across rocks as easily as plastic does and so those are snag points so as nice as the rock sliders were on here uh, they were hindering the vehicle uh, when i took them off the off-road performance you know went through the roof compared to having them on there uh, just eliminating one snag point right there yeah look at all those scratches man Ooh. this baby is rallied but once again that paint 
paint kind of hides it. You get back a little ways and uh, stuff disappears. Or fly by. Front bumper, once again, Marlin Crawler's front bumper. Poison Spider winch fair lead on the front. And this bumper is unavailable anymore. So, uh, well, they still make it, once again, but endlessly back ordered. So, blah, blah, blah. There you go. On our bumpers. Drivers, we do have a driver and a passenger in there. Pay no attention to the shirt. That's off of a different person. But we do have a driver and a passenger in there. And the, and the steering wheel, the steering wheel does move. That is a moving steering wheel. I have a servo hooked up to that. That was a, a custom little homemade rig on that guy. But there is a servo underneath the dashboard. And the steering wheel is hooked up to a servo. So if I turn my, get it all hooked up and plugged in right, <laughs> when you turn the uh, steering to the left or to the right, the steering wheel turns to the left and to the right. But I just never got around to finishing the driver. Uh, reason for that is uh, I don't run that just because it takes power away from the steering servo. It looks great, but it robs power going to the steering servo. <laughs> so ultimately, I'd rather have the power going to my steering servo uh, rather than divide it between the steering servo and this extra servo that just spins the steering wheel left or right. So it was taking too much power, so I pretty much just left it alone as it is. Otherwise, I would have uh, broken this driver's shoulder or arm off of his shoulder. And then I would have inserted a spring into one end of his arm and one end of his shoulder and concealed it with his t-shirt. And then glued his arm onto the steering wheel or glued his hand onto the steering wheel. That way when the steering wheel went left and right, his arm would have went with it. But uh, I never finished it and that's where it sits. But that's how I would have done it. So we have a driver and a passenger sitting in there. They are Velcroed into position. Uh, let's go ahead here and peel our body off of the vehicle. Uh, body melts. <laughs> Yeah, this is a long video. Uh, body mounts on this guy. I'm not using our factory body mounts per se, and I haven't used that style for a very, 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 very long time. Initially, the body is screwed down or fastened down with these two M3 screws, this guy right here and this guy right here. That is where your body initially sits. Now, I made a plastic uh, plate to go in between those body mounts that I could use as a body lift so I could raise up the vehicle a little bit higher. Um, they do make a body lift for this vehicle, but the, at the time when I was shopping for a body lift, that body lift was back ordered endlessly. <laughs> so I just decided to take a piece of plastic plate and uh, make my own. So I use a plastic, some, some plastic plating to, for a body lift. Uh, the body mounts are the more important part here. This is what I want to get into, not so much the body positioning. But I'm using two M3 screws coming out that plastic plate the other way. So we've got two screws right here, two M3s, holding this plastic plate into the stock body mount position. And then further up on the plastic plate, I have two M3 screws coming back out with the thread facing us. So the only thing holding this body in place are these threads right there. So the body basically just snaps on and snaps off into place. You have to spread the body apart a little bit to get it onto these stock body mounts or to position it for these stock body mounts. I basically just have it sliding over top of these screws and that holds it into position and it, uh, it works pretty well. You don't have to unscrew anything to take the body off. I've never had it pop off on me on the trail. Once again, this truck's been rolled countless times. It's been slid down hills sideways countless times. As we can see, it is just, uh, well, the paint hides it, but the body is uh, rallied. It's covered in scratches, gouges all over this thing. All across the hood, it's got gouges, man. This thing has slid down hills. On his roof, <laughs> slid down on a light bar. It's got gouges all over this thing. And this body has never popped off. So a uh, very solid system here. You don't have to have a body lift on it to use this little system. You can use a couple of grub screws and uh, remove your stock M3s and just install a couple of grub screws in there. It's like some half inch long grub screws. And just leave them sticking out about a uh, quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch. And that's enough to uh, fasten the body on. Once again, you have to spread the body apart to get it onto those body mounts to begin with. Uh, that action <laughs> of spreading it apart is what's holding it on there. So uh, that extra little bit of tension is what's holding it together. So let's get this thing on the tripod. We'll pop off the body real quick and look at the rest of it. All right, removing the body. Well, we got to take off a little bit of winch line tension. If I can unhook or undo the winch hook, that's kind of holding everything together. Disconnect our little toe strap on the back. Let that dangle down. Once again, the body is just being held together with 
body tension. So we're just going to pull this apart on either side just like that. The body pops off. Yeah, getting snagged on my fenders, but there we go. <laughs> so the body pops off without the uh, without having to unscrew or anything, which is very, very simple to put on and off. Installing it back on there, we just slide it back down to position. You got to pull the body apart anyways to get it over top of these mounts. We're just placing it over top of those screws. Just like that. Very solid. Not going anywhere. So no worries about running screws back in to hold your body down. Just put a couple grub screws in there. Let that grub screw stick out a little bit. And that's a uh, quick, easy way to attach and detach your body. Very solid mounting system. So there's a look at our body once again off of the truck. Underside of the body has been painted black. Everything is black on the underside. Here is our extra little servo that we have right there. There's it mounted to the steering wheel. Uh, Velcro in certain places. I used to hang a battery up here, a little <laughs> uh, six volt battery to power things up. So I do have Velcro sitting in certain places for battery hangers and whatnot. But um, using a RC four wheel drive uh, Trailfinder 2 LED kit on it. So we've got the stock wiring harness for a Trailfinder 2. I've got all the wires pretty much ran back here by the bed, back in the corner. This is where I have all my plugs to go into the receiver. I mount it back here. Um, this is the wire going to the servo. I've got that going into a open socket or a dead socket up here. A socket that's not plugged in any, into anything just to keep this wire protected so it doesn't get corroded or nasty from the elements. So it's still nice and clean. And these are basically the two wires that I plug in for my lights. One is for the light bar and one is for the harness on the uh, truck itself. Or the lights on the truck itself. All the wires are being held in with duct tape for the most part. Not brand specific, whatever brand works for you. <laughs> Black duct tape would definitely look better uh, versus gray duct tape. But just trying to keep everything as neat as possible. And all the wires in the bed come to a certain point and run down the middle. And they're covered in duct tape as well. These two points back here that you can obviously see, these two corners. I used to have two big magnets glued in back here, which adds a lot of extra weight. <laughs> but I had the magnets glued back in there uh, because I have some, some tow chains that I use for towing, for towing vehicles out, actual chain. And the magnets used to keep them held in place. So the magnets were glued on the underside of the bed, which is a good idea if you want to keep things scale and you want to keep things held in place on your truck. Uh, two big magnets glued in on the underside. And that would keep those chains from moving around on the inside. You could flip the truck over upside down and those chains wouldn't go anywhere because they were being held in with those magnets. So I used to have two big magnets glued in right here on each corner on the back. Tow chains. I think I actually got a, a tow chain laying around here. It was similar to this stuff right here. This is actually a bridle right here, but uh, this is kind of the chain that I was using for a tow chain. And I believe that uh, those actually came off of a plant a plant hanger or a planter, a planter box or whatever that you, you know, go to Myers or Walmart or whatever, go into the lawn and garden se section. And they've got those hanging flower pots. Uh, that's what those chains came from, one of those hanging flower pots. All right, so that covers our body portion of the vehicle. We can set that off to the side. Yeah, let's look underneath the hood of the truck here and check out some of our stuff that we got going on. All right, so we got a receiver box right back here. I've got a hole drilled in my receiver box, and I have a brand new receiver back here. Uh, the receiver that I used to have back here was a plastic dip receiver, so I had a. I'm running a Spectrum Electronics on this vehicle. I'm running a Spectrum DX4C transmitter, which you can't buy anymore. And this is a Spectrum SR415 four-channel receiver. I had another Spectrum SR415 in here previously that I used for all my river runs. And that whole receiver and the wires coming out of it, I put three inch servo extensions on all the wires leading into the receiver and then labeled everything so I knew what everything was. One for the uh, ESC, one for the steering servo. Um, so everything coming off of it was labeled for what it was supposed to go to. You know, accessories and all that other good nonsense. And then I plastic dipped the entire receiver and those three inch wires to make that whole thing waterproof. And that is why there's a hole in the top of my receiver box because I had that bundle of wires sticking up through the back half or the top half of the receiver box. And then recently I had some issues with that receiver and um, it quit working on me. <laughs> uh, probably due to exposure to too much water and things of that nature. 
Um, I think water eventually did make it down through the wires, even though everything was plastic dipped and the wires were kind of all bundled together and plastic dipped, the water still made it in. It could still make it through those wires. And at that point in time, it had no way of getting back out. And that eventually ruined the receiver. So plastic dipping the receiver, not necessarily a good idea. Um, a lot of the receivers that you buy, if you look at them, they'll say that their air quotation is waterproof. So, um, you know, as long as you don't submarine them too bad and then you're running in clean water, you should be relatively okay. They do make some spray-on coatings that you can get for your receivers. If you pull the casing off your receiver and put, spray the circuit board uh, to coat it and make it a little bit more waterproof. And that is probably the best way to do it. Uh, plastic dipping is not necessarily the, not necessarily the best way to go. Uh, it does seal everything off, but it, it retains moisture, uh, meaning that if, if the receiver gets hot um, and then cools down or whatever, and depending on what environment you're in, if you're out in the freezing cold weather and the receiver is getting hot and cold, cooling down, it can build up condensation on the inside, and you can't get past that. Uh, another thing that you can't get past is rusty water. If you're playing around in rusty water, a uh, rusty river, or dirty, dirty river, depending on how clean the water is, <laughs> it may bridge the connections on your circuit board and uh, fry everything out. So uh, you got to be careful playing in water and uh, with waterproofing and all that other good nonsense. So yeah, I'm rambling, but there you go. Spectrum SR415 receiver sitting in here, hole cut in the box just because it was plastic dipped at one point in time. Uh, ESC, this is an Axial AE5 ESC. Uh, now they're made by uh, Dynamite. <laughs> so a Dynamite Axial is a new, new style of ESC. And we actually got a couple of those guys hanging around that are the exact same style. It's an Axial AE5. This is a Dynamite Axial AE5. It belongs to my brother, but Axial right there. And now it's a Dynamite on the top because uh, they were bought out. <laughs> I believe Horizon Hobbies uh, picked up the slack on a lot of things and they purchased Axial. So there we go. So this has an original AE5 in here. It's been in here for six years. Never had a problem with this ESC. It's been underwater countless times. I mean countless times. And it's still working great. So original Axial AE5 ESC. Battery. This is not sitting in the normal position, if you noticed. Normally your battery sits side to side across the back of the vehicle. Right back here is where your battery sits normally. Boop, boop, right in between here. And I found that that is uh, too much weight on the back of the vehicle. And really, once again, hinders you from climbing up steeper hills. So I've custom laid my battery down the center. And I've had my straps kind of crisscrossed across the battery tray to hold it into place. And it's kind of wedged in between the speed controller and the uh, wired winch controllers and wireless winch controllers that I have over here on the side. We'll get into those in a minute. So it's kind of wedged in between those two, kind of resting on top of the transfer case. Gets the battery's weight a little bit more central on the vehicle, which allows the vehicle to climb steeper hills a little bit easier. Moving on to our winch controllers and a light controller. All right, so we've got two controllers sitting right here. These are both made by RC four-wheel drive. One is a wired winch controller. And I use that as a light switch to turn my lights on and off, to remotely turn my lights on and off from my transmitter. So I'm using a winch controller as a remote on-off switch for my LED lights. <laughs> so the wired winch controller goes to my LED lights. And then below that, down here, is a wireless winch controller. Now these look funny because they have been plastic dipped. I dipped them in that plastic dip tool coating. Dipped the wires in it as well. Uh, just to make that, once again, air quotations waterproof, made sure to sync it with my radio before I plastic dipped it. Made sure to sync the uh, wireless winch controller to the to the little transmitter before I plastic dipped it. Because <laughs> if you try to sync it afterwards, you're SOL. You're not going to be able to do that. So it needs to be synced beforehand. Uh, once again, plastic dipping. Uh, these winch controllers are not waterproof. You can probably get that spray-on coating to put on there. It would be a, a much better alternative than using plastic dip. But uh, when I plastic dipped these, I don't think they had that spray-on coating back then when I did this. So I did this stuff back in 2016. So they've been on here for a long time. They still work great. Wireless winch controller going to the winch. Wired winch controller going to my lights. Wireless winch controller, I've got it sitting right here on the back of my transmitter. Uh, we were talking about having the wired versus wireless. Um, wired, when it hooks up to your radio, once again, you when you stop reeling it in, it doesn't stop when you take your finger off the button. <laughs> it keeps going for a second. The wireless one, this one is more pinpoint accurate. It's only moving in when you're pushing the button. It only moves out when you're pushing your button. As soon as you take your finger on the off the button, it stops moving. 
So the wireless one, in my opinion, is much better than the wired version. So wireless going to the winch, wired going to the lights for an on-off switch. Alrighty, um, motor. Let's talk about the motor. And a motor location. And at the motor, all right, this has been clocked. The motor has been clocked down into the chassis to lower the center of gravity, uh, improves your departure angles, or not your departure angles, but improves your departures in general, uh, going down steep hills and things of that nature, less likely to end over or flip over uh, head over heels. <laughs> I'm not sure who the person was, the first person to come up with the idea of clocking the motor into the chassis, but that was a darn good idea. Uh, many thanks out to that person. Uh, as far as this one is concerned, I first heard about this or seen this on the RC Sparks channel. One of RC Sparks' buddies had a ready-to-run TF2, and he did the same thing on his, but they really didn't go into detail about it. And then I seen this on, I believe it's RC Everyday, RC Everyday's channel. And I think he had a video on how to clock these into the clock the motor into the chassis. So that's where I first kind of read about it or seen a seen the uh, video about how to do that. So the motor's clocked into the chassis. Once again, it lowers your center of gravity. This one's sitting just about in the center of the chassis, just about even with the frame, or at least even with the front cross members. Now you have to be careful about doing this. If you're running links on your vehicle, if you're running links on your TF2, you're not going to be able to get away with clocking your motor this far into the chassis. Uh, you can clock it, but maybe not this far down into the chassis, just because the link uh, hookups, there's a bar that hooks up on the back half of the axle, and that's where your link's attached to. And once you start compressing your suspension, it'll end up hitting your motor. So if you're running links, you can't necessarily clock your motor into the chassis, which is kind of a bummer. You know, I mean, links are... Uh, definitely better than leaf springs as far as overall suspension travel and articulation. But uh, if you want to have that motor countersunk in your chassis or clocked into the chassis so you can lower your center of gravity and improve the vehicle's handling all the way around, you can't do it with links. So that's unfortunate. You can't clock the motor with links on your vehicle. As far as clocking the motor, it's a little bit of a job. There's a little bit of work involved with this. I don't know if we can see this or not, but this motor plate here that's attached to the bell housing on the transmission. It has these screw hold downs that go to the actual motor plate itself, which attaches to the motor. Now there is two tabs, or there's supposed to be two tabs right here uh, that attach this plate to this other section of plate. If we flip the truck over upside down, we can see that on the bottom. I'll set my truck on something so it's not gonna fall over here. So we've got these two attachment points right here and right here going to the motor plate. Now we used to have the same thing up here on the top. We used to have the same kind of bend on it with two attachment points. So I had to cut off one of the attachment points on the top as well as cutting off some material on the back half of that motor plate to uh, eliminate the other <laughs> attachment point on there uh, which gives us enough room to clock us in in between the frame. Now there's a couple other things that you need to do in order to accomplish this. This steering servo mount right here is a solid cross member that goes from here all the way across to the other side of the frame. Uh, right down in here, which we can't see. But, uh, right about where those little slits are on the motor, there's a little notched out area. And that is what's left of the cross member. Now you have to save that little piece. This little piece here that goes into the frame, you need to save that because that's threaded. Threaded. And that is what your shock hoop attaches to. So you need to save that little chunk that goes into the frame. That way you can uh, thread your shock hoop back into it <laughs> and have a solid mounting position. So uh, FYI on that, this cross member needs to be cut right here. That servo mount cross member needs to be cut. You need to leave the other part over here that attaches to the frame intact. So you got to cut off just that little nub. That way you can re reinsert it back into the frame and use it for a nut essentially to hold that... Uh, hold that shock mount in place. This front cross member right here, I needed to, I had to come in and just remove a little bit of material on the back edge of that, just to allow a little bit of clearance. So I had to remove that cross member, put it on a grinder, remove a little bit of material right here, just to give us some uh, clearance around the bell housing. And then as far as clocking it into the, the frame here, pretty easy to do uh, with the transmission. <laughs> Just a matter of removing your spur gear, which are these three screws right here. One, two, and three. A lot easier to do with the motor out and with the steering servo out. Just pull the spur gear off of there. 
and that'll reveal the bolts that are holding or the screws that are holding this uh, motor plate in place. And this is clockable. Uh, I say clockable if you picture the face of a clock. 12 o'clock at the top, 6 o'clock at the bottom, 3 o'clock over here, and 9 o'clock over here. There is screw holes drilled around in various locations around the bell housing on this transmission. And they are threaded, so you are able to uh, loosen these guys up, take the three screws out that are holding that in place, clock this around to a different position, and reinstall them into a different position. So initially the motor sits up, up top, like right up here, and we dropped it down into the chassis significantly. Which, once again, approves your departure angles. Like when you're coming off the of hills, real steep hills and things of that nature, you're less likely to flip over having that weight lower down into the chassis. And it also, once again, improves your uh, overall crawling ability just having that weight lower in the chassis. Steering servo. Let's talk about the steering servo for a split second here. This is a Protec 370 TBL black label waterproof steering servo. Right around 600 ounce inches of torque and uh, 6 volts of electricity, a little bit more than 600 on uh, 7.4 volts. So a fairly strong steering servo, not the servo that I originally had in here. I had a, I had a Savox SW0231MG, and uh, we'll take a look at that here in a minute. Um, and we'll take a look at the, the card for the 370TBL with all the specs on there as well. So the steering servo, since the vehicle is lifted, I had to remount the steering servo. Normally the steering servo would sit on top of these mounts, our cross member mounts right here. Normally this, the steering servo would be sitting on top of these. You would fasten it onto the top. I've got it fastened on from underneath. So I removed the servo, reinstalled it from underneath, and then reattached it, which drops it down roughly a quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit more. And if you're going to lift your truck a little bit, if you're going to run a lift block on the front, uh, such as this one right here, you're going to need to lower that steering servo down. Pretty easy to do, just a matter of unbolting it from that upper position, bring it around underneath the chassis, slide it in from underneath, and then reattach it with some uh, hardware there. I had three millimeter screws and three millimeter lock nuts holding that in place. And I'm using three of those, one, two, and three over here on this other side. Once again, that is absolutely key uh, to drop that down underneath and reattach it if you're gonna be running a lift on your truck or a little bit longer suspension, or if you're looking for longer suspension travel, you're going to need to drop that steering servo down just a little bit more to accommodate that. If you're running links, you can get a lot more articulation <laughs> than you can with leaf springs. That is for sure. You can get much better articulation out of links than you can with leaf springs. Once again, they do make a link kit for the TF2s. I don't have it. I don't plan on getting it. I don't really know much about it. So uh, if you get one, uh, you're on your own with that. Uh, bear in mind, that link kit that they sell for the TF2s, that is based around the stock suspension on the tf2 the stock shocks which once again i believe is a 70 millimeter on the front and like an 80 millimeter or something like that on the back so that those links and the length of the of the links are based around those suspension numbers so if you want to have more travel out of your vehicle longer shocks on the back longer shocks on the front you're going to need longer links to accommodate it and they don't come with that kit <laughs> so uh you're gonna to have to do some custom measuring and uh buying some aftermarket links or doing whatever you have to do to adapt it for a longer suspension. So that is a drawback with having the links versus having leaf springs. Uh, not as easy to add longer travel to it to the back of it with having the links on there once again because you have to guess on how long you go with the links. With having leaf springs you just add longer shocks and the only thing else that you really need to be longer is the drive shaft itself to accommodate that extra travel. All right, so we kind of covered that just a wee bit there. Uh, we're, I'm going to be all over the map on this video, so uh, bear with me once again on that. Uh, motor, I'm currently running a Team Brood, or Brood Racing, Team Brood Chaos motor in here. This is a 35 turn motor. Uh, not the most expensive motor that you can buy, and certainly not the cheapest motor that you can buy. But I got this on sale for right around $66.00. But I want to say it's like a $70 motor or something like that, or a $75 motor. Uh, relatively pricey. And uh, <laughs> probably not the um, best idea to have it hanging low like this down in the elements. But uh, whatever. It is what it is. This is the best mounting position for the motor. The best position to have it sitting in. And uh, that's where we have it. So Team Brood Chaos is what I'm running in here. Uh, initially, I had a cheap RC four-wheel drive motor in here, a $10 motor, uh, which is similar to... This motor right here, this is a 65 turn RC four wheel drive motor. They make the same style motor in 
uh, several different turn ratios. The higher you go on the turn, turn number, the lower the speed on the motor and the more torque the motor has. So 65 turn motor is pretty slow. It's right around, I want to say 6,000 RPMs or 6,600 RPMs. Don't quote me on that. But right around uh, 6,000 RPM, let's say, maybe 6,500 RPM, 6,500, uh, roughly. Uh, the lower you go on it, the more RPMs you get out of it. So a 45 turn motor spins faster than a, a 65 turn. A 35 turn motor spins faster than a 45 and so on and so forth. The lower the turn, the hotter the motor, essentially for RPMs, but not necessarily on torque. So this is a 65 turn motor. I had a 35 turn in here to begin with. I had a 65 turn in here at one point in time. I had a 45 turn in here at one point in time. Um, I, I think the 35 turn works out the best for this vehicle. What's the difference between a $10 can motor and a $65 motor? <laughs> well, all kinds of things from the windings down to having bearings versus bushings. Uh, most important thing in my eyes, other than uh, torque and uh, how fast the motor revs up and all that other good nonsense, is the hill hold. Uh, the better the magnets you have in the motor, the better the hill hold and braking that you have with the motor. So uh, a good motor with good magnets equals good hill hold and braking. Uh, moving back into our suspension here briefly, I'm running some RC four-wheel drive super soft leaf springs on the front and our stock leaf springs on the back. Now, I'm not running the full pack of springs on the back. I'm just, I have one spring removed out of that guy. And same thing on the front. I'm not running the full pack of springs on the front. Uh, the more springs you add, the stiffer it gets and the less uh, articulation and travel that you get out of it. So when it comes to the front, I have our main big spring right there. And then I have the next largest spring right here. And then I have the smallest spring added. Now, for a while, I was, like during that, that one video where I was showing off all the flex on the truck, the serious mad flex on the truck, I just had our main spring right here and the smaller spring. I didn't have this little middle spring in between. And I had a problem breaking these springs. I was breaking the leaf springs just because it was too much flex and not enough support on the rest of the spring and ended up snapping some springs. And uh, I found that it lasts a little bit longer. You get less flex, but it lasts longer having this other shorter spring in there. So we've got the shortest spring right here, the smallest one. The next size up from that, we're missing the next size up from that. And then we have the main spring. So we're not running the full pack. We're missing one spring on each side when it comes to those guys. On the back. Kind of the same thing back here. Same setup back here. We've got the main spring. we got the smaller spring and the next size up, but we're missing one spring in between. Once again, I did used to run that red uh, super soft spring on the back, but I used to snap them like mad. So I uh, started running the stock springs on the back, and it seems to last a lot longer. Uh, not quite as flexible, but the back actually has more articulation than the front. Uh, so it really doesn't matter anyways because we're getting more travel and articulation out the back than we are on the front regardless Even though we're using a stiffer spring setup back here All right uh, Axle shims and degree shims and things of that nature I'm running one small degree shim on the back of each axle if I can get the camera to focus in on it right down there Right there So one small degree shim on the back of each axle uh, just to get that axle pitched a little bit better for the drive shaft angle. All the hardware, that is not red hardware. That is stainless steel hardware. And the, the shim on the bottom is aluminum. So I painted the shim and I painted that hardware with a red Sharpie. <laughs> so once again, red Sharpie shining through. Looks like red aluminum. But that is red Sharpie over top of stainless steel and red Sharpie over aluminum. Now in between our springs... In our shims, I have a small O-ring in between uh, each bolt head. And when I tighten these guys down, those lock nuts down, I make sure to leave a little bit of slack, which I'm going to be hard to show here on camera, especially from this angle. But you want to have a little bit of cushion between the spring and the nut. So I've got the O-ring down underneath it. And uh, the nut, once again, up here on top, tightening that down, but still leaving a little bit of squish room. So if I push down on this hard enough, I can push the leaf spring down past the nut just a little bit. So not cinching it down tight, using O-rings on the bottom for a little extra cushion, and uh, not tightening these down super tight. And that gives you a little extra flex 
having those leaf springs in there or having those o-rings in there get a little bit extra flex same thing on the front i have a degree shim on the front and a, well maybe i don't have degree shim no degree shim on the front <laughs> i have a lift block on the front and the o-rings as well get the camera to zoom back out a little bit here maybe we, maybe we should pull the tires off of here so we can get a better look at this but one large lift block on the front which is this guy right down here there's a lift block and then i've got the two o rings and then our spring our leaf springs once again leaving a little bit of cushion so I push down on this i can get that spring to drop below that nut just a little bit so leaving a little bit of cushion on there for extra flex so the o-rings that's kind of a little secret there <laughs> putting those in there uh, that doesn't come with the kit i actually learned that uh, from a crawler guy at nankin hobbies in farmington hills once again not being sponsored by anybody but uh jim over there at nankin hobbies in farmington hills told me about that little trick about adding some o-rings in between the springs and uh yeah it was a good tip good tip there jim and this is the spec sheet for that protec 370 tbl steering servo it is waterproof our operating voltage is 4.8 volts to 7.4 volts max is 8.4 operating temperature range 14 degrees fahrenheit to 140 degrees fahrenheit or negative 10 celsius to plus 60 celsius pulse frequency i'm not too sure what that's all about <laughs> I don't know what that little insignia is down there. Uh, 15, 20, whatever that is, to 333 hertz. Operating speed, well, it's not too fast. It's not too slow. On 6 volts, it's 0.135 by 60 seconds, 7.4, 0.13 uh, to 60 seconds. Static holding torque. This is just holding torque. 6 volts, 38.3 kilograms slash centimeters, or 533 ounce inches of torque. 7.4 or 42.1 kilograms or 585 ounce, in, ounce inches. That's a tough one to say. Dynamic peak torque, 6 volts, 43.2 kilograms or 600 ounce, ounce inches. 7.4, 46.8 or 650 ounce, ounce inches. Uh, so dynamic peak torque, that's not, uh, that's like maxed out peak torque. I'd imagine... It, it's RMS or it's continuous torque would probably be uh, somewhere in this area between 530 and 600. So uh, maybe 550 or something like that. And uh, same with this one, 585 is probably 600, 610 or something like that uh, for its continuous uh, power. And this is just as dynamic peak power. Weight, 72 kil kilograms, made in Taiwan. This is brushless. These are our dimensions right there. Uh, don't be afraid that it's made in Taiwan. This is a very good steering servo. And here is another Protec 370 TBL, black label. This is what they look like when they are brand new. They come in a little plastic case, packed in foam. This one belongs to my brother. A great introductory servo. Awesome introductory servo. Very cost-effective, waterproof, digital. It's the Savox SW0231MG. SW-0231MG. Awesome servo. That is for sure. Great introductory servo. I'm not too sure on the torque on this. I think it's right around uh, 198 or 200 ounce inches of torque, somewhere in that area. Uh, this was recommended to me by RC Sparks way back in the day, back in 2016. Uh, you don't know who Aaron is at RC Sparks, feel free to check out his channel. Uh, I'm sure once you start watching his videos, you'll probably never watch my videos again. <laughs> Uh, and Aaron, if you're checking us out, feel free to unblock me at any time. I'd love to talk to you again. Great introductory servo. When I first started buying these back in 2016, they were right around $30 US. The price has gone up a little bit. Uh, they're less than $40 currently. So in between $30 to $40, right around $35, $36, something like that. Comes with a lot of hardware, a bunch of uh, different size servo horns on the inside of here. Uh, different size M3 screws with uh, relatively fat heads on the M3 screws. Uh, they are black, along with some black nylon lock nuts as well. Uh, big fat heads on the lock nuts. So pretty good hardware that comes with this as well. Here are the specs on the back. SW0231MG, weight is 66 grams. Speed, uh, 0.17 seconds. Uh, can't see what our other little <laughs> uh, numbers are up here. 
torque on six volts. This is the most important part since it's a crawling servo. 15 kilograms on six volts or 208.3 ounce inches of torque. So 208.3, a little bit more than what I thought. Great introductory servo once again. This was a recommendation from Aaron at RC Sparks back in 2016 to myself. And it was a great recommendation. So there we go. Good alternative servo. Uh, very cost effective, especially compared to the ProTech. ProTech has a lot of power <laughs> in a small package. And uh, big money. Right around $160 US. Don't quote me on prices once again. Right around $160 uh, compared to uh, less than $40. Not bad for the sad box. Let's talk about the battery for a second, even though you really can't see it all that well because it's been plastic dipped. <laughs> this is a Duratrax Onyx 7.4 volt 2S LiPo. It has a 45C withdrawal rate, 5.7 amp or 5,700 milliamp, 5,700 milliamps. Uh, 5,700 milliamps translates to 5.7 amps. If it was a 6,000 milliamp, that would translate to 6 amps. Uh, 5 point, or 5200 would be 5.2 amps, and so on and so forth. So for every 1,000 milliamps is 1 amp of electricity. 1 amp, 1,000 milliamp battery is 1 amp, 2,000 is 2 amps, 3,000 is 3 amps, 4,000 is 4 amps, and so on and so forth. 5,700 is a 5.7 amp battery. So this is a Duratrax Onyx 7.4 volt 2S LiPo. Uh, 8.4 volt fully charged. I've never had one drop below 7.6 volts on a run and this battery at 5.7 volts or 5.7 amps <laughs> will run this vehicle with the lights on uh, for a good two hours. Once again, never had a battery go dead on me. Now, I'm not too sure if they make this battery anymore. Um, this battery right here would be a good alternative. We use this in my niece's slash. I've got another one of these two that's identical. Uh, Duratrax Onyx. This one is part number DTXC2002. Now, if you're looking at the batteries, some of these part numbers vary depending on the connector. This has an XT90 on it. So its part number is DTXC2002. Now, there is one that has a Dean's connector or a T-style connector on it, and it has a slightly different part number down here. But this one is a 7.4 volt, 6,000 milliamp or 6 amp, 50C with when it comes to crawlers and crawler electronic speed controllers or ESCs for short, you have to be careful on the C rating. Uh, most crawler ESCs are only rated for about a 50C max. So you have to be careful that you don't push 50C <laughs> with a crawler. Uh, check your ESCs uh, specs and make sure that it can handle anything above 50C. Uh, once again, most crawlers are only rated for about 50C max uh, as far as the ESC is concerned. Most of my crawler batteries are right around 25C. Uh, this one in this vehicle, it happens to be 45C, but I wouldn't go with anything more than 50 uh, if you're planning on putting it in a crawler. 7.4 volt, 6,000 milliamp or 6 amp, 50C withdrawal rate, 44 watt hour. Now the withdrawal rate there for you newcomers, the higher you go on a C number, the faster the battery discharges. That is the discharge rate right there, that C rating. So a 25C battery discharges more slowly than a, a 50C battery. The higher you go on the Cs, the more discharge you get. Now what does that mean? What does that translate to? That translates to punch when you hit the throttle. Not top speed. It's not going to change your top speed. That C rating is not going to have anything to do with the top speed on your vehicle. All that has to do with is the punch, the initial torque. When you hit the gas, stab the throttle, how much initial torque you get, how much initial grab you get, uh, how much discharge you're getting. So the higher you go on the discharge, a 50C battery, like this, has more punch than a 25C. If you were to stab the gas on a 25C battery, maybe the tires spin a little bit. If you stab the gas on the 50C battery, they're going to spin a lot more. <laughs> so uh, you're getting a faster discharge rate or a higher discharge rate uh, with a higher C rating. Uh, 25Cs, there's nothing wrong with a 25C battery. I use those on my TRX4 Broncos. And that gives you a good long duration, a good long run time, a good consistent draw. It still has decent punch. You're not really losing anything on punch, but it runs the equipment longer. So if you have a lot of equipment on your vehicle, uh, winches and lights and things like that, and you're running it off the same one battery pack, if you're running everything off of one battery pack, your main battery pack, you want to find something with higher amp number and a lower C rating. So like an 8,000 milliamp with a 25C is going to last a long time powering all that equipment. The batteries that I use in my Broncos, or the TRX4 Broncos, are also Duratrax Onyx. 
DTXC 1883. This is a 25C battery, 8,000 milliamp, 7.4 volt, 59 watt hour. And this guy is quite thick. It has been plastic dipped, but it is significantly larger or thicker than this other battery. So that is a big battery. A lot of extra weight having this battery in there. And uh, plastic dipping it adds even more weight to it. <laughs> uh, this was a soft pack, similar to this battery, which just has a shrink wrap going around it. Uh, now, most of these batteries are somewhat water resistant to begin with. Uh, when it comes to lithium polymers, lithium polymers can actually ignite if they're exposed to air. So if you get a hole in the side of your soft wrap battery pack or your hard plastic battery pack, uh, you're in danger of that thing catching on fire. And these guys are somewhat waterproof. I say that because they're somewhat airproof. If they weren't, they would be a fire hazard. <laughs> so they've got these guys wrapped up pretty tight. They are somewhat water resistant. And I mean, I'm just talking about splash. A little splash here, a little splash there isn't going to hurt it. But if you hold this thing underwater, uh, due to the water pressure, it will seep in and you will have, you will have problems. So I don't recommend running a soft pack battery in the water. That is for darn sure. This is a soft pack battery, but has been plastic dipped and plastic dip tool coating. And it's a little bit more waterproof than a standard soft pack battery. So this one's a 5.7 amp. This one's a 6,000 or a 6 amp. And they're both basically the exact same size, except that one's been plastic dipped. 3S versus 2S. Uh, this ESC, this Axial AE5, this is uh, 3S compatible. So you can run this on 3S or you can run it on nickel metal if you want. Uh, just depending on where you have our pins set at right down here. One pin is for the uh, brake at 50% or 100% braking. The other pin selection right down here, you just pull that out with a pair of pliers and reinsert it in a different position, is to switch it from nickel metal to lithium polymer. When it's in lithium polymer mode, it has a low voltage cutoff. When it's in nickel metal mode, it does not have a low voltage cutoff. So it'll drain your battery till it's dead when it's in nickel metal mode. If you run a lithium polymer on nickel metal mode, it'll drain your lithium polymer until it's dead. <laughs> and you don't want that. Uh, you don't want to drop your lithium polymer below 6 volts or else you're not going to be able to recharge it. And that's a hazard. So you don't want to do that. When you have this on lithium polymer mode, it has a low voltage cutoff, which shuts off at 6 volts. So when your vehicle stops running, that means it's time to unplug it and charge up your battery. If you were to unplug it from your ESC and plug it back in, you'd probably get a few more minutes of runtime out of it but you're going to be draining your battery down below a safe level and you're not going to be able to recharge it. So once your ESC shuts off and once your vehicle stops moving, that means it's time to charge up your battery. Let me rephrase that. When I say the vehicle stops moving, I mean stops moving forward and backwards. It's only going to stop moving forwards and backwards. Your steering is still going to work. That low voltage cutoff just shuts off the voltage going to your motor. So your steering is still going to work and you're going to be wondering what's going on and you're probably going to unplug the battery and plug it back in if you're a newcomer to, to uh, lithium polymers and whatnot and your vehicle will start running again. At this point in time, you're definitely in danger of uh, dropping your battery below the safe voltage level. So once the vehicle stops moving forward and backwards, but your steering still works, it's time to unplug it and charge up your battery. Uh, 2S versus 3S. 2S, we are putting out 7.4 volts or 8.4 fully charged. 3S, we are 11.1 or 12.6 volts fully charged. That is a lot of power. But I find that all my crawlers do pretty well on 2S. I've never had a problem with 2S on the crawlers and never really felt a need to run 3S on, on any of my crawlers. Just, just don't need it. It's kind of overkill. The 2S batteries do just fine. All right, let's peel a tire or two off this vehicle and look at our rear suspension and all that other good nonsense. Uh, suspension and articulation, believe it or not, depending on your wheel hex size, that also plays a factor. And the uh, backspacing on your wheels and all that other nonsense, that also plays a factor on your overall articulation. The wider it is across the back here, the more articulation you get. You start making things a little bit narrower, the less articulation you're going to get. Uh, it's kind of weird how that works. But uh, if you have... Uh, you know, it depends on how far out your tire is getting there when you're squ squishing a suspension. But a little bit longer spread gives you a little bit more articulation, but it also brings your wheels out from the wheel well a little bit further. It might start uh, scraping your tire on your on your inner fender well on your body, depending on how uh, wide your wheel hexes are. Now, these guys right here are a, I believe that is a 6 millimeter wheel hex that I'm running on here. 
Uh, it might be an eight millimeter. <laughs> but this is either a six or an eight millimeter wheel hex. I'm not too sure. Let's just measure that thing out real quick. Why don't we? Since I'm unsure on what size it is, we do have a dial caliper right here. So we'll turn this thing on. Uh, zero it out. There we go. And we'll see how many millis this guy is. Eight. So this is an eight millimeter wheel hex right there. Not sure what the stock is, stock wheel hex on, is on it, but uh, it's significantly less, probably half of that. <laughs> probably about a four millimeter wheel hex. So I'm running eight millimeter wheel hexes on it. It also depends on your wheels and the backspacing on your wheels. Backspacing right here, how far this hub is spaced out from the uh, front half of the wheel. So all this stuff comes into play when it comes to backspacing and your wheel hex size and all that other good nonsense. Looking at the back with these Tamiya shocks on the back of here, I had to use a custom shock end down here. It is somewhat tapered. This is an RC four-wheel drive shock end with that bent linkage like that. They do make metal ones as well from RC four-wheel drive. These are plastic. Uh, metal ones would probably be a little bit better, aluminum ones. But I needed to have that on here in order to get these shocks spaced out away from the leaf springs. If I had a straight eyelet coming off of here, the shock would be closer to the leaf spring and it wouldn't clear. So that's something that you need to keep in mind with the shock width, the width of your shock on the back of the TF2s and how wide you go. Uh, a lot of those aftermarket shocks with the springs on the outside are just a little bit too wide to get in here. And you might need an end link down here with a little bit more of a curve on it. That way you can bring your shock out a little bit further away from that spring. So you're not going to bind up. So I've got a slight curve on this one. If I had a straight shot on this, the shock would hit the spring. But having that slight curved end link on there or eyelet, it clears everything okay. And once again, not getting as much twist out of this as I previously did when I ran the 100 millimeters on the back of here was getting a lot more uh, suspension articulation out of it versus these 92 millimeters. So we lost eight millimeters of uh, articulation kind of, well, not necessarily eight millimeters, that is our overall length, but we lost a significant amount of travel when we went to that smaller size shock. So that is a little bit of a, uh, eh, a little bit of a drawback, but having oil filled shocks versus the spring uh, shocks was a big payoff. So the oil fields make a huge difference back here. Now, another little custom mod that I had to do with these shocks to get these to work right, were the eyelets for the shocks, right up here, our upper eyelets. Now these shocks didn't come with a little floating ball on the inside. It's just basically a hollow uh, upper point up here. <laughs> so I basically used some wire insulation. So like insulation off of a ESC wire, let's say, like this stuff right here. So when you're stripping some wire, whenever you're stripping wire, save that little bit of insulation because you might need it for something. And it worked good for padding. So I've got a little bit of wire insulation right in between our shock eyelets right here. And a washer on the back half of the screw that attaches it to. That way it kind of mushrooms it out a little bit. And it gives these shocks some flex. It gives them some room. If I can get my hand in here on one of these. It gives the shock room to twist from side to side. Let's see. And it can also float in here a little bit front to back. Like that. So sometimes having things solid mounted, like if this was bolted up solid, you would get less flex and less articulation and less suspension movement out of it versus having it float around a little bit and uh, float around but yet dampened. It's being dampened by that rubber tube on the inside, which gives you a little bit more flex and a little bit, art a little bit more articulation. So that is a custom mount on the back here using that little bit of wire insulation as a sleeve on the inside of that shock tube or your shock eyelet and then uh, running the screw through that 
gives you a little bit more cushion, a little bit more movement, and it allows for a little bit more flex. Just like adding the O-rings in between the leaf springs and the mounts. That gives you just a little bit more flex than what you would normally get if it was solid mounted. So keep that in mind. Little uh, little cheaters. <laughs> These little tips right here. This, this is the competitive edge. Uh, having the O-rings on your springs. Having these little O-rings in between here and here, or the um, little bits of wire insulation, you know. Um, it's kind of a competitive edge right there. Having that little bit of extra flexibility translates to more articulation and more suspension flex. Get our tire put back on here. Using a team-associated... Uh, wrench here, hex wrench, nut driver, not being sponsored by anybody, but this team associated wrench set or nut driver, these guys are super handy, they have a very uh, varied selection of hexes on the inside, a couple different nut drivers on the inside depending on which one you purchase, you make a couple different models of this wrench, everything is magnetically attached, works great, highly recommend it. Especially to you newcomers to RCs, I highly recommend those team associated wrenches. Uh, once again, these rear shock mounts aren't doing anything on the back of the vehicle. These guys right here aren't doing anything other than holding these plastic panels in place, which block off all this mess underneath the vehicle. And yeah, that is a Blockbuster DVD case <laughs> that I used for that. Uh, yeah, you know, using what you have at hand. I was going to paint these black, but never got around to it. And it is what it is. But uh, there we go. Just using this to cover up the wires uh, underneath the bed of the truck. Our rear body mounts, talking about body mounts uh, again briefly. Uh, I'm not really using these to hold the body down. I just have the little pins put in place right down here. And these guys are cut off so they don't stick through the body. I'm basically just using this as a locator for the back of the body. So the body's sitting on these pins, but it's not being held down by these pins. The only spot that the body is being held down on is these two points right here. And once again, this is a homemade body lift on here with just a just a plastic panel, a little sheet of plastic. And I've got multiple holes drilled in it. So if I want to raise the body up higher, I can. This is attached in our stock factory location. And I've got two small M3s running back out. And they're not sticking out very far. I'm sorry about the camera angles, but they're not sticking out very far. Just enough that that body can grab a hold of it, and uh, it works quite well once again. And that is the only position, or the only point, is right here and on the passenger side that's holding that body in place. And once again, I've rolled the truck down hills countless times, uh, dropped it off of huge drops and landed on the body, and the body has never came disconnected. So it works quite, quite well, uh, easy on, easy off of the body once again. And a good alternative to buying the RC four-wheel drive body lift just using a plastic plate and uh, making your own body lift. <laughs> Once again, I was gonna order the RC four-wheel drive when I had ordered it, but it was back ordered. And I uh, was able to make this plate in about 10 minutes. And uh, yeah, you know, 10 minutes for a plate was a lot <laughs> faster than waiting uh, a few months for that RC four-wheel drive back order, back ordered item. Uh, front shocks and whatnot. All right, let's peel off the front tire. I put the wrench away, but hey, we're gonna bust it back out again, I guess. Once again, RC four wheel drive tires, knock off aluminum wheels from who knows where. Looking at our front suspension setup. Once again, we're using the stock perches on the rear portion of the front axle. The super soft leaf springs, we're not using the full pack. We've got the biggest spring, uh, the second biggest spring, and then the very smallest spring. <laughs> and that's all we're running. Once again, I used to just run the main spring and the smaller spring. But I found uh, when you're really flexing this guy out, it has a tendency of breaking these super soft leaf springs. So I, uh, I found that it worked out better having that other one in between there. Uh, very simple setup on this stuff. Uh, our steering link right here, this lower steering link, I reversed that. That was sitting on top of our... Um, which one calls down here? <laughs> I know the name of all this stuff. I really do. I, I'm just drawing a blank on it right now. Uh, this draw bar or link right here was sitting on top of this mount, and I mounted it below it. 
uh, just to give me a little bit more, well, I did that for a reason. I can't remember exactly what the reason was, but uh, I think I did that just to get a little bit more clearance past the springs and a little bit more articulation. I can't remember because it was so long ago. I did all this stuff in 2016. And then the next link down here coming to the arm, I do have a little bit of a spacer on here. I believe this is a 26 millimeter screw right there. And I do have a spacer on this just to raise this up a little bit so we're not so extreme on our uh, pitman arm and whatever angle coming off of that. Have a metal arm on the servo or a metal servo horn on here. It is a Protec servo horn that's on there. And it's like double clamped. It's got a clamp on one side or a screw on one side and a screw on the other side that kind of clamp that baby down. So that thing is not going anywhere. <laughs> Uh, reason for having another reason for having that strong steering servo on there is that there is a lot of slop in this front axle between the springs and everything else. And uh, I just pulled the wheel hex off, <laughs> but between the springs and everything else, there is a lot of side to side motion in this axle, and that eats up torque off your steering servo. It takes torque to compensate for all that slop that's in there. And having that 600 ounce inches or inch ounces or whatever you want to call it of torque helps compensate or helps over overcome that extra bit of slop that's in there uh, as far as axles go i've had different axles on this vehicle at, at one point in time or another i did have some boom racing axles on here some uh, boom racing uh, fat something or other axles and they were meant for 2.2s uh, for running 2.2 tires so they're supposed to be heavy duty axles they had a helical cut ring and pinion differential gears on them uh, but i ended up breaking one of these ears off i ended up breaking one of the kingpins or whatever one of the mounts and just snapped it right off the axle broke it so I ended up putting the stock axles back on. Lots of wear and tear on the stock axles. Lots of <laughs> rock rash going on down here. Once again, uh, the Tamiya Bruisers have that skid plate that goes down across the bottom of here. And that seriously hinders your off-road ability. You will be uh, getting snagged on that skid plate. Uh, even having that skid plate off, having metal axles or having no skid plates with the TF2. Didn't come with skid plates, uh, which I'm happy about. But it still takes a lot of abuse down here. You still get a lot of rock rash going on. But these axles are pretty darn solid for what they are. They are pretty darn tough. Uh, they are over six years old and they still work great. Never had a problem with them. So there they are. Uh, steering radius isn't as good as the boom racing axles. The boom racing axles had a 45 degree turning radius. I think these guys are right around 38. I could be wrong, but I, say, I think it's right around 38 degrees. Not the best turning radius on a TF2. Uh, probably even less on the Tamiya Bruiser, just because the springs on the Tamiya Bruiser are a little bit wider apart. So the springs are closer to the tires, which means that you can't turn your tire in uh, as far when you're turning <laughs> before it starts rubbing on the springs. That's another good positive note about the TF2, is that the springs are a little bit narrower on the axle, which gives you a little bit uh, tighter turning radius or a little bit more leeway for having a tighter turning radius. Uh, front axle, once again, I'm running a lift block on the front. One of the larger lift blocks on the front. That is a separate kit that you can get from Trail from T. Uh, a separate kit that you can get from RC Four Wheel Drive. Excuse me, the lift block kit. And there's a bag of different blocks right here, which you can't see because the bag is nasty. Uh, so we'll dump it out. Why not? Okay, we dumped out the bag, and it's sticking to my fingers like static, <laughs> static discharge. So this is a, one of the larger blocks right here. That go between your leaf spring and the axle. That is the largest block that comes in the kit. This is the next size down. And this is the next size down from that. Now when you order a lift kit from RC Full Drive for your vehicle, it only comes with enough material for one axle, just for one. So if you plan on lifting uh, the front and rear equally, you're gonna need two of these kits. Once again, I've got the large, larger block on the front, which I just dropped. <laughs> One of these guys right here is what I have on the front axle. Now, there was a point in time that I did have uh, a lift kit on the back as well. I did have these on all four corners, two of these big lift blocks. And that was when I was running those giant Proline at 2.2 Super Swampers. Is when I had those lift blocks on there. And uh, you know what? They're not the best for going off-road. It gets your vehicle higher in the air, yes. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily give you any more clearance because... Uh, you're still limited by your differentials and how much clearance you get there. Adding a bigger tire definitely gets your differentials higher off the ground. So you're not as likely to, to scrape on something. 
But those 2.2s were just way too big and got the truck way too high in the air. And it was just insanely tippy. So, uh, yeah, it wasn't really a good uh, good uh, combination running 2.2s on this vehicle. I, I found the 1.9 tires are a much better option. And moving on. All right. I suppose the next thing to do is to take a peek at the underside of the vehicle, looking at drive shaft angles and things of that nature. Our drive shaft angle right here, coming to the front. No degree shim on the front. I used to run a degree shim on the front, but uh, I found that it was better without that. Once again, I'm running a smaller degree shim on the rear axle, which we can't see right now, but there is one on there. <laughs> we do have a small degree shim back there uh, to get that axle pitched upwards a little bit more, dropping stuff. Just to get our drive shaft angle a little bit more upwards or pitched. Uh, right now it looks pretty gnarly because we are using our we have our TerraFlex Z boxes right here that are dropping this down right there. But when it's sitting compressed on the ground, it looks like that. So it's not terrible. It could be up a little bit higher. In all reality, I could pitch that back just a little bit more. So it's not terrible. All right, our transfer case skid plate or transfer case mount. This is a boom racing transfer case mount, a boom racing low profile transfer case mount. Now, there is a couple other low profile transfer case mounts that are made. Uh, when I purchased this, this was the only one that was made. Uh, but I believe RC4 Drive makes one. I know Bauhaus makes one as well. That's been 3D printed, like a 3D printed plastic mount. And this one is aluminum. Uh, a little bit more strength out of the aluminum. Now, the major difference between this one and the stock skid plate, the stock skid plate is kind of shaped like a shovel. <laughs> and it's kind of dubbed the shovel in the RC community uh, just because it has a tendency to grab onto everything and scoop out dirt and things of that nature. The Boom Racing Low Profile Transfer Case Mount uh, is a little bit more rounded up on this edge right here so it doesn't catch and snag on things. Uh, it gets your transfer case a little bit higher up into the frame, low profile mount. Uh, it does change your degree angles a little bit because it's raising it up higher into the frame, but it gives you better off-road clearance. Now, one thing that I had to do with this that I really haven't told too many people about was when I put the metal drive shafts on here and having this vehicle lifted at such a degree, I started experiencing some hop, some axle hop. And I didn't necessarily know where it was coming from, and I eventually found out. <laughs> What it was, was the shafts, the output shaft, going to the front and rear drive shaft. On the inside of this little coupler down here, that shaft used to protrude quite a long ways through that coupler. And was actually hitting on the other end of our drive shaft right here. It was hitting on these ears on the drive shaft. So whenever the drive shaft was rotating, and it would get to this lower position down here, and if we can spin it around, if we spin the motor around here, Yeah, it's taking a minute here, eh? When it was getting to this lower position right here, sorry about the camera angles, <laughs> it was hitting that metal shaft that was protruding through. Which is tough to explain, especially on these angles with this camera. But it was hitting on that metal shaft. So I basically took these off on either side, took our little couplers off of the transfer case, and I removed material off the end of that shaft. I cut about a sixteenth of an inch of material off the end of each of those shafts, left just enough that I could attach our drive shaft without uh, running the risk of breaking that shaft or whatever. So uh, where the hole is to attach the drive shaft, I left a little bit of metal past that hole. This will give that hole uh, some good strength. Basically just cut that shaft off flush with the inside of this mount. So that shaft wasn't sticking out any further. Now that's like a little top secret thing right there because uh, it took a while for me to figure that out why my vehicle was hopping and the more you lift your vehicle the higher you up you get it up in the air the more drastic your angle is going to be right down here and then this point right here is going to start hopping on that shaft because once again the shaft coming off the transfer case uh, is a little bit long and it sticks quite a ways through the drive shaft coupler down here and ends up uh, hitting on the drive shaft ears there the ears on the u-joints ends up hitting on these guys so once again i had a take these guys off and trim a little bit of material off each end of those uh, off the output shaft that way it wasn't going to hit on the drive shaft yeah tough to explain <laughs> but a little bit of material had to get removed just to eliminate that hop drive shafts uh, these are RC four wheel drive um, Punisher shafts RC four wheel drive Punisher shafts 
and uh, they've been on here for a long time. And the U-joints are getting a little bit worn out on it. <laughs> so we're getting a little bit of slop in our drive shafts just because the U-joints are starting to wear out. Uh, the stock plastic drive shafts that come on this vehicle, those are garbage. Those are garbage. Uh, they, I had problems with those day one just crawling around in my living room. I have a couple, couple of my original videos of this vehicle with no body on it uh, before I painted the body. Uh, crawling around on a homemade course that I made in my living room at, at my house downstate. And uh, yeah, I was popping drive shafts. I was I was uh, separating them where the plastic wraps around the, the U-joint <laughs> area. It was just separating and popping apart. So the stock drive shafts are junk. I was, uh, once again, popping those things loose and uh, just crawling around in my living room. So the heavy-duty steel drive shafts is a must when it comes to your Trail Finder 2. These are a must to have. And these are slightly longer than the stock length. I'm not too sure uh, what the overall length is on these guys. I would have to take them apart in order to figure that out. <laughs> but they're uh, a little bit longer than the stock drive shafts. I'm not too sure uh, what our overall length is on these guys. But when you start lifting your truck, you're going to need longer drive shafts to go along with it. It was trial and error when I did this. I, I ordered the stock drive shafts first and they weren't long enough. And then I ordered some longer ones, and, and they weren't long enough. <laughs> and then I had to order some longer ones and, until I finally got it right. Uh, and those guys are expensive to buy. These are like right around $50 for a set of drive shafts. And if you're not getting the right length drive shaft on the first try, uh, it can get pretty darn expensive trying to get the right one. So if you're going by trial and error and uh, purchasing drive shafts that way, it's going to be an expensive run. It's going to be an expensive trip. Uh, because you're going to end up having to buy a few sets before you get the right ones, the right length. Once again, I'm not too sure what these guys are on overall length. That would be helpful now, wouldn't it? Um, we should take these apart and measure them somehow or another. And I'm not looking forward to doing that. <laughs> I am not looking forward to doing that at all. Uh, once again, I'm not too sure of what our overall length is. I want to say they were like uh, 96 to 121 or 96 to 120 millimeter is I is I think is what is sitting in my head for a number. The 96 millimeter, which is fully closed, to 120 millimeters fully open, I believe is the right one, but I could be wrong. It might be 96 to 130 millimeter, <laughs> or possibly 98 to 130 millimeters. I'm not too sure, but uh, I believe it's a 96 to 120s is what I'm running on here. 96 millimeters to 120 millimeters, I think is what I got on here. And the front one is a different length than the rear. I think the rear is slightly longer than the front, if I am not mistaken. Um, I'm going to have to take those guys off and measure it. And that is going to be uh, not the easiest thing to do because I've got these guys Loctited down. So uh, not the easiest prospect to take these things apart. But you know, you know what? We're here. We're on video. And uh, there's... Uh, you might as well just get it done right now, right? If you're here, you're doing it, the room's already paid for, why not just get it done? So let's pull these guys apart and see what our total length is on these drive shafts. Let's spin this around so we get an accessible point here. Access our grub screws. There we go. Make sure that we have the right hex for the grub screw. And that one feels a little bit big. That might be the right size. Yes, it is. Well, I don't necessarily like taking these apart just because I have all the stuff locked together using blue Loctite. And uh, you know what, when it comes to putting your TF2 together, they're gonna tell you to use Loctite in a lot of places and I don't necessarily recommend it. <laughs> uh, especially if you use red Loctite. If you use red, you're gonna be dead. Don't go don't go with the red stuff, you'll never get it undone. I used the blue Loctite on this stuff and uh, it seems to work out okay. If you're having trouble getting the hex out, it might be easier to put a little bit of heat on it before you attempt to pull it apart, just to break away that Loctite. We've got our pins removed, and our front drive shaft removed. 
All right, so here's a look at our front drive shaft. All metal, pretty rusty. Definitely rusty. All right, so let's get a measurement on this guy and see what our overall length is and all that other good nonsense, which might be difficult to do, uh, especially with our floppy ends here. <laughs> Trying to measure our floppy ends, so we're going to have to lay this drive shaft out on the table. I'm not sure if we're going to catch this on camera or not. Using our dial calipers here. And my arm is probably going to block our view, but oh well, as long as we get our measurement, we should be good, right? Alright, so this is 100 0.62 millimeters, 100 millimeters all the way closed. So I was wrong on that. 100 millimeters closed. Not too sure what it is fully extended. I don't think we'll be able to fully extend it safely without having it come apart. So I'm going to fully extend it to a certain degree. Not to the point of coming apart. Just to see what kind of a length we get out of it. Just so we can guesstimate this. So 100 millimeters closed. Got that? 100 millimeters closed. And open for roughly 119 millimeters. So roughly 119 open. So I'm guessing this is a 100 to 120 millimeter shaft. And that's my guess, 100 to 120 on the front. So write that down, 100 millimeters to 120. That'll get you in the right ballpark for this suspension setup. Not too sure what the one is on the back. We're going to, have to take that one apart next. I'm going to pause the camera. I'll slap this drive shaft back on just to save time, and then we'll pull off the back one. Before we do that, <laughs> let's look at the output shaft on our transfer case. So right here is where I made the cut, right there. This shaft was sticking out too far. And once again, when the drive shaft was turning on an angle, getting onto a strong angle like this, that... Uh, output shaft sticking through was hitting on these ears right here. Whenever it was rotating past, it was catching on these guys. Just like that. You see how close that tolerance gets on the inside of that shaft to the coupler? Pretty close. And that drive shaft was sticking out, or this output shaft was sticking out quite a bit uh, past uh, the opening right here. So that was creating a snag point and uh, the vehicle was hopping. So I had to remove those and use a sawzall to cut some material off the front and rear portion of that output shaft just to uh, thin that down a little bit to eliminate that hop. So now we don't have any more material uh, sticking through the back half of this coupler. Uh, this is probably going on the wrong way, but no more material sticking through the back half. Which is what you want. Eliminate some hops. So that's another little custom tuning uh, thing that I did. Uh, not too sure that too many people are going to show you that. So that one right there is a custom custom mod to eliminate some drive shaft hop. Once again, uh, not too many people are going to show you that one. All right, we got her undone. She's been disconnected from the transfer case and rear axle and rear pinion. Rear, rear ring and pinion, I should say. Get our drive shaft laid out there and check out our closed length and our open length. Close our calipers, make sure that we are zeroed. Alright, we got a zero out. Make sure that we're recording. Are we recording? Yes, we're recording. Can we see what's going on? No. There we go. Get these guys opened up. Let's see what our overall length is. So our front drive shaft, once again, was 100 millimeters to 120. And our back, what are we looking at here? We are 110 millimeters closed. 110 closed. 110. Not too sure what it's going to be open. I'm sure a lot more than 110. Our brother has just joined us. Feel free to walk in there, Ian. I'm doing a little bit of filming here, but it's okay. My brother is just getting off of work. He works a late shift. So our total open length here, rough guess, is 
is 130 millimeters. 130. So we're 110 millimeters closed and 130 all the way open. And I think it should be a little bit longer. We could use a little bit more length on the back. Uh, maybe 135 or something like that would be okay. But we're 110 closed and 130 open. The front was 100 millimeters closed and 120 open. 100 uh, to 120 on that front drive shaft. And this back one, once again, we are uh, 110 to 130 millimeters in the back. All right, we got our drive shaft put back on. Everything's all good to go. Tires are all on there. All we need to do is slap our body back on it. And we should be pretty much wrapped up with that portion of it. All right, so there is a good look at our vehicle. A good overview on everything, I believe. I think we covered everything, all the bases on the vehicle. Bumper mounts. All right, the rear bumper mount. These are all aluminum bumper mount mounts. And this one is uh, raised up. This one is sitting above the frame. I'm not too sure on the overall size of this one. I believe these are reversible, so you can uh, flip that around upside down or right side up. <laughs> right now, this might be uh, upside down. I might actually have it flipped it upside down in there. So the rear bumper mount sits above the frame ever so slightly. Just to give me some awesome departure angle. Front bumper is sitting even with the frame. That is one to one with the frame. One to one. Which gives us awesome approach angles. So those are our bumper mounts. They are aluminum. Front one is one to one with the frame. Rear one is slightly elevated. <laughs> Sits right up above that rear cross member back there. Looking from back to front, this is my antenna tube right here. I do have a plastic antenna tube on it. And I've got that running right through the center of the bumper mount down here. With a little uh, rubber cap on the end of it just to kind of seal out the elements and it kind of conceals the antenna at the same time you really don't need with the new 2.4 gigahertz radios you really don't need uh, this much antenna sticking out but uh, yeah you know I got the full length sticking out uh, I'm trying to get as much range as I possibly could I did this on day one so it's uh, been there for a long time <laughs> plans have changed and I've changed my style up quite a bit in between day one and and six years later but uh, yeah there we go so there's a look at the underside of the TF2. Once again, battery sitting in a different position. Normally it sits sideways across the back, right back here. I've got it sitting vertical right up, right up the middle of the chassis just to distribute weight a little bit better. Motors clocked down into the chassis just to distribute weight a little bit better, give you better departure, uh, better departures, not the better, better departure angles, but smoother departures when you're coming off of steep obstacles. It's less likely to nosedive on you. Having that motor a little bit further in gives you more control when you're um, climbing up rocks and things of that nature. Keeping that weight lower, uh, lower to the ground. Low center of gravity is good when you're out crawling. Uh, talking about leaf spring suspension versus links. Uh, yes, we have leaf springs on the vehicle. Once again, it is a very raw setup having leaf springs on here. Once again, my only vehicle that has leaf springs on it. I like it because it has leaf springs on it <laughs> because it's the only vehicle. But uh, you don't get as much suspension articulation with leaf springs as you would with links if you got a link kit on this truck with the proper length links for whatever lift you're running you would have much better suspension travel much smoother suspension movement than you would running leaf springs so there's a price to pay with running leaf springs you don't get as much articulation and uh your suspension travel isn't as smooth <laughs> as it would be if you're running links but once again i like running leaf springs on this vehicle just because uh, it's, it's it's raw. It's like a real four-wheel drive truck with leaf springs, you know. Not all new newer vehicles have links on them. Well, a lot of the new vehicles do have links on them these days. <laughs> but back in the day, uh, everything had leaf springs on it. So uh, even these old Toyota trucks, or especially these old Toyota trucks, they had leaf springs front and rear. So I like kind of keeping that stuff uh, how it's meant to be. Once again, if you had links on the front, you could definitely get a lot more suspension travel and a lot more articulation out of it. Um... And once again, we're not getting the same kind of suspension travel and articulation out of this vehicle now as we did previously. On my previous videos of when I lived downstate and I had those 100 millimeter shocks on here, we were getting crazy travel. 
But since we swapped down to 92 millimeters, we're not getting as much articulation. We're not getting as much travel. So paying a little bit of price for these oil-filled shocks. Oil-filled shocks are nice. Um, the, the fluid dampening on these Tamiya shocks is great. Only problem is, is that we don't have that travel. We don't have that same 100 millimeters of travel that we did with those cheap RC four-wheel drive shocks at 100 millimeters. Yeah, so finding some decent shocks with this would be beneficial. Uh, not too sure what I'm going to go with. Maybe a set of pro lines. I just, I just don't know as of yet. So once again, need some one, 100s on the front and 110s on the back, and that would get us back to that articulation that I had <laughs> way back in the day. Right now, we're kind of lacking on our articulation. Yep, long video. This one's going to be a long video. Looking at the transmission. I'm trying to finish this up here. So this is a stock transmission that came with the RC 4-wheel drive Trailfinder 2 Mojave 2, which is a two-speed transmission. And I eliminated the two-speed transmission. Now, there's just too much slop in between... Uh, the shift drum on the transmission so right down here there's a shift drum this is the uh, shift fork right there if you were to pull this back uh, that would shift it from low gear into high gear um, there's a little fork on the inside that slides a gear back from one side to another and uh, there's too much slop on that on that gear where that gear sits on the shaft on the inside the high gear low gear where it sits on the shaft there's too much slop from side to side and uh, that translates to rolling slop when you're driving off-road. So when you're driving off-road and you're coming up to the edge of a hill or the edge of a drop-off, the truck would want to roll a little bit and then come to a stop. Because if that was the slop. I see that little slop right there that we're getting right there? That was the extra slop that we had in the transmission. So we, we got a little bit of slop in our differential gears, you can see, but everything's moving. right? But uh, once you started adding all that up, in conjunction with the slop that was in the transmission it was insane <laughs> it had a lot of slop and uh, when you came to a stop sometimes it didn't come to a stop it would roll forward a little bit further and it might cause you to drop off an edge or something like that uncontrollably so when it came to the transmission i didn't really use second gear i hardly ever use second gear and that was one of the reasons i bought the truck is because it had a two-speed transmission but <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is that i hardly ever use second gear and i wanted to eliminate that slop so right now, this vehicle is locked in the low range, and there is absolutely no slop in the transmission. None whatsoever. So I took the transmission apart. I eliminated that shift fork. I took that shift fork out of there. I, I basically took our low gear, and I welded it into the low gear position. So I made sure it was in low gear, and I took an arc welder and literally welded that gear to the shaft on the transmission. That way, there is absolutely no slop on that gear to the shaft. And we eliminated all our slop in the transmission. So when we start rolling this guy, it immediately starts turning the drive shafts. Unlike before, you could actually get about two turns, two full turns on this, or a good turn on it <laughs> before it would actually start to move the drive shaft because there was so much slop in the transmission. So you start to turn the spur gear, and you would get about this far before it would start to actually turn the vehicle. And now it just it starts turning the drive shaft as soon as you start spinning the gear. So we eliminated all the slop in the transmission by welding it in, in, in a low gear. And uh, yeah, I know it's, it's not for the newcomers. It's definitely not for the newcomers welding your transmission in the low gear. Uh, RC four-wheel drive does make a single speed transmission for these vehicles, so that might be a better option. I'm not too sure on the gear ratio on that single speed versus the two-speed transmission. The two-speed transmission might have a lower low range than that single speed transmission. Uh, just because that single speed transmission they're trying to make that more universal so it covers the gap from first gear to second gear right so it's a little bit a little bit higher than the low range on here and a little bit lower than the second gear on here than the high range on here this being a two speed transmission the low on this one is probably a little bit lower than that single speed transmission and the second gear is obviously faster than that single speed transmission so having this locked in low range it might have a slightly lower uh gear ratio versus that single speed transmission not for sure once again just guessing at that uh based on transmissions and two speeds and things of that nature but this guy is welded into low gear uh over here on this side that low gear is welded directly to the shaft and once again that eliminated all our slop in the transmission which makes the truck uh, a lot more smoother when you're out crawling and i think that just about covers everything on the truck Once again, body goes on pretty darn simple. Just spreading out the plastic over top of those uh, screws or studs that are sticking out. Just like that. Making sure that I got it on both sides. Yeah, she gets locked down. 
good to go with those easy peasy body mounts. Very easy to uh, hook up like that. Get our winch line restrung and put back into position where it needs to be, which holds our hook down and keeps everything nice and tight. Uh, the winch line running up the roof like that is also a good limb riser. If you're driving under tree branches and things like that, tree branches hit that winch line and ride up it and don't get snagged on your truck. So that makes a good limb riser, having that winch line strung up to here uh, as an anchor point for it. And there we be, she is all back together. Articulation, flexing it out, all that other good nonsense, uh, yeah. Uh, there's a front flex, the back's all compressed, so we're not getting as much travel or th that we used to get out of this vehicle. We can clear two 2.2 tires stacked on top of each other, but we can't clear three. There's no way. Not with these 92 millimeter shocks on here. If we had those 100 millimeter shocks on there, uh, we would have no problem clearing three of these 2.2 tires, which is uh, upwards of six inches. We'd have no problem clearing that. I mean, I can clear it right now if I push down on the truck. If we have it set up like this on top of these tires, like that, and I push the truck down, we're hitting those marks. But if I let up on it, <laughs> it wants to tip over. Uh, but once again, we need longer shocks on here. If we had some 100 millimeters on the front and 110s on the back, that would really maximize our, 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 uh, maximize our articulation. But right now, with our 92 millimeters on there, we're losing a little bit of suspension travel compared to what it was like in some of those older videos. When I show the vehicle seriously flexed out there uh, on the kitchen table, you can we had the 100 millimeters on there, so we're getting a little bit more travel. Once again, 92 millimeters, not as much travel, not as much articulation, uh, but having those oil-filled shocks on there is a better ride overall, so the vehicle handles much better with those shocks on there. All right, so there we go, boys and girls. There is a quick little walkthrough on the Trail Finder 2, all you, all you newcomers to the world of RCs. Uh, newcomers to the TF2s and working on those things and modifying them and whatnot. There you go. There's a quick look at my TF2. It has been through many stages in its life and uh, right now, sitting where it's at, is probably the best that it's ever been as far as off-road capability. So there we go, boys and girls. That is going to do it on this video. Very much appreciated for you all sticking around and watching the video, especially at this length. Questions and comments are always welcome and we'll see you all on the next one. Thanks again.